Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of uh, January 15th, 2015. This is our first meeting of the year 2015. Um, the way we traditionally start these meetings before we actually convene, and no reason to break tradition tonight, we start with uh, public comment. And public comment, let me break the rules down for you essentially. Clearly there are a lot of people interested in speaking tonight. So. Um, we ask that you limit your remarks to three minutes or under. Don't feel obliged to meet that three minute mark, except don't go over it, please. Um, you, anyone can speak on any topic. And it seems that we have a few topics to discuss tonight. It doesn't have to be on the agenda. Doesn't, you don't have to be a resident of Northampton. What we do ask is that you recognize the rules of decorum, uh, speak with respect, and I think we'll do all right. There is a caveat. If you do start speaking over three minutes, and clearly tonight this is particularly important, if you speak over three minutes and I, and I remind you, and yet you continue to speak, not even wrapping up, then I'm going to ask you to stop, and if you refuse to stop, we're going to call a recess, the cameras go off, and we all wait until you quit the chamber and stare at you and go tisk tisk. The, the object is to hear from everyone. Now given the amount of people that are signed up tonight, we could be here for a long time. But one of the things I'd ask you to consider as you speak, many of you are going to be speaking on the same issue. As you speak, um, consider speaking about a new point that hasn't been made yet. Because the idea is to promote edification and understanding. And we can do that by getting more information as opposed to reiterating the same thing over and over again which I just did. I reiterated same as <laughs> um, just to be redundant. So that said, when I call your name, please step up, repeat your name again and your address, and the floor is yours. Oh, well, another, another thing is that uh, according to our rules, and they're good rules as far as I'm concerned, the council is constrained from speaking. Uh, they, we will not engage in a back and forth, so don't think that we're ignoring you the fact is is that we this is the public's opportunity to speak to power as it were such as we are and so um, with that said we're going to start with the early arrival of former council president Jim Dossel good evening thanks Bill uh, I'm glad you explained all the rules I tried to tell my grandson Brandon that I couldn't say hello to him so <laughs> well, well played. <laughs> My name is Jim Dostal, and I live at 624 Ryan Road in Florence. In reading the report on compensation for elected officials, I have several comments. First, I would like to outline my experience. I was employed by the Department of Public Works for 42 years. For 15 years, I was on the contract negotiating team for the DPW. Then, I spent 15 years on the negotiating team for the professional department heads. In the late 70s and 80s, I was a member of the Personnel Department Wage and Classification Committee that did a salary survey and wrote job descriptions and ranked all city employees except for teachers. I have served 10 years on the Northampton School Committee and 10 years on the Northampton City Council. And after I retired, I spent 13 years on the Board of Public Works. City councilors serve on at least three committees and meet at least what that meet at least once a month. They have two city council meetings and many ward committee meetings. They meet privately with the constituents to answer questions. They answer phone calls day and night and help constituents navigate through and with city departments. They drive their own cars to and from all meetings, plus investigating problems throughout the city with no mileage allowance. A city councilor will work an average of 30 to 40 hours a week. The compensation committee used <coughs> five cities of equivalent size to base their recommendations on for council, pres for council president. Agawam, Hoyoke, Chicopee, Pittsfield, and West Springfield. 
the average pay was $11,200 for council president. The five cities averaged for councilors 9,660. Now it's important to mention that all of the survey cities offer health insurance to all city council members. The committee has recommended that the following salaries, <coughs> council chairman 10,000, at large councilor 95, and ward councilor 9,000. Uh, excuse me, Jim, but I'm going to set precedent with you. You, you just timed out. Um, did, did you want to wrap up with one sentence? Yeah, I will. Uh, I think that the amount of money set for insurance should be added to the city councilor's pay and let them buy their insurance on the private market or through the city, whichever way they want. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Natalia Munoz. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I think that... Uh, and Natalia, identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm Natalia Munoz. I'm the chair of the Human Rights Commission, but I'm speaking as a private citizen. And the Human Rights Commission will bring this up as well. Este, I think that what, the, what cops do is really hard work. They, they deal with the meanest people, the most violent people, este, people at their worst. They miss birthdays and anniversaries and all sorts of things, and they work you know, every hour of the day. At the same time, I don't think that that gives anybody the right to say, in this case, for instance, that city councilor, Alisa Klein, has no right to speak her mind about institutional racism. Institutional racism, racism does exist, and everywhere, not just in the Northampton Police Department, every police department, every school department, every healthcare system. It's just institutional racism is everywhere. It's not a problem of the United States alone. It's a problem worldwide. So we have to address it. And I believe what we should do is have the city council and, and, and the mayor appoint a special commission comprised of people from the police department and the DA's office and organizations that work with communities of color and city councilors and other people from the community to come up with a list of recommendations so that what's happened in Ferguson, what's happened in Staten Island, what happened in Cleveland, what's happened in so many communities in this country for centuries does not happen in Northampton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Pam Hanna. Pam Hanna, 11 Church Street. I'm speaking tonight as a resident of Northampton and a publicly elected official. I represent Ward 1 on the school committee. And I want to show my support to Elisa Klein, Ward 7 City Councilor. I applaud her for her leadership and for speaking out against the epidemic of state-sponsored brutality facing peace, people of color through increased criminalization, police violence, and mass incarceration. When she was attacked in print and online by the police union and our local paper, they distracted from the real issue, that being Black Lives Matter. While I cannot know what it feels like to wear a police uniform and the vulnerabilities that come with that, as a white person, I know what it means to have racial privilege. When I get called out on my racism, it is my responsibility to listen, apologize, reflect, and learn so that my future acts are ones that bring about racial harmony and justice. Acting out in defense or deflecting blame elsewhere will only alienate and does not serve to build connection or build a safe community. I also want to say that I was at the rally in November and appreciate all that our local police did to accommodate the crowd that night. They could have restricted us to the sidewalk, but they didn't. Because of what seemed an act of solidarity at the protest by our local police, I was even more shocked and outraged at their subsequent attack of Ms. Klein. Why did they not choose to take this opportunity to have dialogue around strategies to make our community safer, especially for people of color? I implore members of the city council, the police force, and all aspects of government to work or continue their work on understanding oppression and their role, our role, in contributing to it so that we can have a safer community for all, and in particular, for those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lois Ahrens is next, but maybe not. There's arrows moving things around. Uh, so Amy Bookbinder, 
you're, the arrow leads to you. Okay. Hello, uh, Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue. I'm here in support of my counselor, Elisa Klein, and her remarks at the November 25th rally for justice. And I'm in support of counselors Labarge and Adams, also in attendance. I was going to read my letter to the editor last week, but that was then, this is now, after attacks on Councillor Klein's right to free speech and mischaracterizations of the rally have shamefully escalated. As to her remarks being, quote, divisive, inciting, disrespectful, and improper to Klein's comments encourage people of color to fear and hate police, rather than dispute these statements myself, as we approach Martin Luther King Day, I prefer to use his words of 49 years ago, sadly still apparently needed here in Northampton today. This is from Meet the Press in 1966. Lawrence Spivak asks him, Superintendent Police of Chicago, Mr. O.W. Wilson, said the other day that your civil rights tactics have aroused hatred of, of Chicago's white residents and are hampering the Negro's progress. What's your answer to that? Martin Luther King. Well, my answer is that this is totally erroneous. Our civil rights efforts have not aroused the hatred, they have revealed hatred that already existed. There is no doubt about the fact that there are many latent hostilities existing within certain white groups in the North. We didn't create it. We merely exposed it and brought it to the surface. I'm going to ask now, comments from the audience to be <coughs> stifled. Please, if you are going to, if you have an opportunity to speak, and so when I it, have a brain problem, I just sometimes say. I understand. So, if you're capable of controlling that, that'd be great. Uh, Amy, you get your the compensated sack. You can add a few extra. To uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, as to the other in misinformation about Klein's remarks and the rally, from rally participants were disrespecting the NPD office to the officers to their faces to the rally hurt the feelings of the NPD officers if the shoe fits wear it but this was not an anti-police or anti-Northampton police rally and to demonstrate that after the speeches I congratulated rally organizers and speakers but added that I was disappointed at the rally held on the steps of our city hall about police brutality but not one word was said about the use of excessive force in the Jonas Korea case right here in Northampton, in which he, a young man of color, was violently arrested on trumped up charges. And instead of answering calls for an investigation of this, our mayor and our police chief instead promoted the officer involved. Here was the response I got from the organizers and the speakers. This rally was called in response to the killing of Michael Brown and others across the country and the failure to indict. It was not called to address our local policing issues. And, and Amy, so let this important conversation continue, but let's have it based on facts. I've got a couple of run-on sentences and an extra minute. Thank you. As I've said before. So, uh, just to point out, we actually gave you your extra minute. We did. We gave you the compensated second, so. All right. I'm going to end with this then. As I've said here before, I support good policing, but I think that we need to call out racist or unjust policing. And for, um, last sentence, and for doing just that, in solidarity with close to 600 people at the rally here and millions across the country, and for using her right to free speech, I proudly end with this. Je suis Alisa. Thank you for supporting me during my injustice with the police, with the police railroaded me because I was white. All right, thank you for helping whoa, me with whoa, your whoa. support. All right. You're, you're going to have to leave. Oh, that wasn't nice. You're going to have to leave. All the way out. All the way out. All the way out. I'll say that. I'll say that.
Okay. We're back. Um, and, and again, I'm going to ask folks to, I understand the, the temptation to run over, but for the, for, okay, do it outside though, please. Yeah. I won't arrest me. How about calling the police? I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you uh, thank you. As we as we uh, settle back, what my 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 plea again is, of course, we're all going to die of old age if everyone decides that they got to run over a couple of sentences. Um, but I think I think the message is being imparted, and I'm grateful for that. But please, I'd be even more grateful if you kept within the three minutes. Uh, Sadia Shevin. If you can manage, Sadia, you're. I, I, <laughs> I, I hope I have very little to say. Um, good evening. My name is Sadia Shevin, and. My name is Sadia Shevin, and I'm a resident of Ward 7 um, and voter. And I'm here in support of my counselor, um, Elisa Klein. I live at 8 Cosmian Avenue in Florence, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here, hang on, Sadia. Hold on, please. Thank you. Thank you. You get some extra seconds. Okay. Uh, uh, order, please. Can we please have some order? saja has been waiting to speak for a long time. Please be quiet. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to say thank you to Bill for um, his assistance in that matter. Um, once again, my name is Sadia Shevin. I'm a resident and voter of Ward 7. I live at 8 Cosmian Avenue in Florence, Massachusetts, and I'm here tonight in support of my city councilor, Elisa Klein. Um, and over the controversy about her statements, which I'm sure we've heard enough, ab enough about by now to really know what it's about, um, I feel that she really, she hasn't discredited the Northampton Police Department. She's more tried to bring to light an issue in policing throughout the nation. And I believe that she has the right to do that, and not only the right, but the responsibility to speak out about something that she feels is unjust and that many of us here, including myself, also feel is unjust. Um, and I, I mean, as a private citizen, and I, I feel all of us, and especially the city councilor, council, councilors, especially the leaders in our community, should be, um, feel free to speak out about issues that they feel are unjust and um, whether we incite controversy, I say, great, but um, I do not feel that we should silence ourselves when there is something that requires our attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily Woodward, please. Is Emily here? Oh, there she is. Okay. We're all here. Um, um, good evening. My name is Emily Woodward. I live at 46 Evergreen Road. I'm a resident of Ward 7. I'm here to speak in support of Ward 7 Councilor Elisa Klein regarding the public responses to her statements at the Black Lives Matter rally on November 25th. I am proud and grateful to call Elisa Klein my city councilor. Every city in America needs elected officials like Elisa Klein, courageous leaders who call out social and economic injustice and urge their community to confront it. 
I am stunned that Ms. Klein would be accused of inciting violence locally merely for naming violence nationally. Identifying a national problem embedded in racism and white privilege is the first step a local community must take to confront its own issues of racial inequity and work to make change. Northampton is no exception. Racism exists in every city and institution in this country and the world, as the previous speaker said. Police brutality towards black people in the United States is the collective responsibility of a white dominated society whose institutions perpetuate racism and white privilege. And the Northampton Police Union, rather than attacking the messenger, has an opportunity to listen to the message and take an active role within their powerful position as community leaders. They can learn the history of the black experience with white law enforcement and cultivate compassion. And they can encourage all of us to join together in making constructive change. To attack an elected leader who makes this call is taking steps <coughs> backward, not forward. In closing, consider the civil rights leader whose legacy we honor with a federal holiday on Monday. We don't achieve Dr. King's vision of equality by saying, happy MLK Day on January 19th. We achieve Dr. King's vision of equality by answering his call to take action in fighting injustice. Dr. King demanded moral courage of American citizens in order for true equality to grow and thrive. Elisa Klein represents this courage and the leadership we need in Northampton because she takes up the challenge. She walks her talk knowing that we all benefit, white and people of color, when together we denounce racism and fight for equality. Thank you. Sharon Moulton, please. I'm Sharon Moulton and I live at 48 Evergreen Road in Excuse me. <laughs> 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 looking for those Evergreen Road residents, let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sharon, we'll add some time to yours, no, too. But I, I don't need it. I, I'm just standing up to say thank you to Elisa and that I think that every person, especially elected officials, need to be living according to their conscience. Thank you very much. Thank you for your brevity. Uh, Matthew Gibbs, please. Hi, my name is Matthew Gibbs. I own One Bar and Grill at One Pearl Street. Um, I'm here in opposition to the mayor's suggestion for new liquor licenses in town. I guess what I want to say first is I purchased the last available liquor license at a premium, obviously. I invested in this city, and, and it, it cost me dearly. And, and although these other restaurants are very fine restaurants, they put a really good product out, and they're very good for the community, it doesn't become an even playing field when you're just going to allow someone in my position to get a smack on the back and say, oh, tough luck that you had to pay this absorbent amount for the value of this liquor license when all these other ones are out here. Kind of, here you go. And, and I guess that's, that's the big point of it is that I think that the city council should really take a step back and, and really assess this before making a judgment or a vote today. I think it needs to be an open air hearing with several businesses and several key figures involved in this procedure. It's, it really puts someone in my position who I've been working in this city for almost 10 years and I spent every penny to my name to start a business in this town and really 
and believe in what this town has to offer a small business owner and now it's almost like punching me in the face saying oh well if you would have waited six months you wouldn't have had to do that it's not an equal playing field it is not good for local business it becomes saturation in town which like I, I mentioned before those businesses do a very good job currently the way they are I'm sure this would help their businesses tremendously but what it would do would take money from Peter to pay Paul and you know as as a small business owner struggling right now with the climate in the city I have to be in opposition to that and I just I would beg the council to reconsider a vote and kind of really look into this because it is not generating new business it is hurting existing businesses and unless you can step back and look at that from that point of view instead of worrying about a casino coming and trying to to be proactive you have to look at the people that invested in this city and look at their best interest as well so voting on this without hearing that entire aspect of things is is not fair and that's about all i have to say thank, thank you. you very much um now i'm guessing lois aarons Oh, so if you can just pa uh, give them to yeah. Councilor Klein and we'll pass them around. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lois Ahrens. I live in Northampton at uh, Five Warfield Place. And I'm um, one of two people that organized the uh, protest on the 25th. Uh, in the last week, we've seen millions march in France and thousands more march in the United States proclaiming their belief in free speech. However, here in Northampton, we are witnessing the opposite. The Northampton police, city, city employees, have organized to criticize Elisa Klein for speaking out against racism. They have declared themselves to be the arbiters of what is all right for people in Northampton to say and how we say it. Next week is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I'm sure that the mayor, who I guess isn't here, <clears throat> and some members of the council will attend whatever is being organized. King's life was dedicated to, race, to fighting racism, still pernicious and still very much alive everywhere today, including Northampton. On November 25th, that is what Elisa and I and other speakers and 700 people or so who attended the rally were saying, Black Lives Matter. It is extremely unfortunate that the mayor and the council have been publicly silent both in support of Elisa's stand and against racism and, in, and for her right to speak out against it, our obligation to speak out against it. I've brought along a photograph, which I've circulated, uh, for each of you on the council to look at. This is a photograph of the chief of police of Pitt, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You will see that it is possible for police to respond completely differently than the defensive, hostile, and provocative way of the Northampton police. Pittsburgh's police chief has demonstrated that there is a way that is open to learning and respectful of free speech. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pocky, Pocky Whelan. Uh, Pocky Whelan, 3 Langworthy Road. Uh, oh, to try to find something that hasn't been said. Uh, just very briefly, I, uh, I want to say that uh, I'm delighted that this conversation is not focusing solely on Elisa Klein, because that would make it a weapon of mass distraction, uh, but rather to support her in, in what she said, because she's speaking for all of us who acknowledge our racism. And I encourage everyone 
to, uh, to take a look at how, as racist white people living in this society, I can call what we, what we live in, are the practices really evil? And as a country, we have an opportunity not only to name it, but to begin to correct it. And Elisa Klein named it. Let us name it and let us commit to correcting this evil. The, the uh, invitation earlier to form a committee to, of different people from various sectors, I wholeheartedly support and endorse. Um, I want to say, apropos of the criticism of Elisa Klein, her comments were not incendiary. They were in response to a tragic event, which was made even more tragic by the awareness of the climate of oppression, which has so long endured by our black and brown sisters and brothers. And Elisa Klein named it. And there have been such vitriolic responses to her comments that you've all made reference to already. It really does invite our scrutiny. The, ra the rally was in November, November 25th, and the, the denouncing of her in the editorial op-ed wasn't published until January 5th. That length of time between the rally and response calls the motivation, in my mind, into question. Um, you may read the transcript, which the American Friends Service Committee has provided for you, or in the uh, interest of sounding rather self-serving, you may go to NCTV YouTube. Uh, there is, uh, you can see Elisa the way she spoke that night and see the whole thing on uh, the whole rally on uh, YouTube, Northampton Community Television. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jen Derringer, please. Jen Derringer. Good evening, Jennifer Derringer, 60 North Street. I am speaking tonight in support of the Lumberyard Affordable Housing Project. I speak with several hats on tonight. Um, as a former member of the planning board, I am delighted that it will be a mixed-use anchor to the Pleasant Street Corridor, continuing the reinvestment of this important gateway to the city. The project will bring a 24-hour presence to the street with the introduction of both residential and commercial units. The project is also consistent with current zoning and reflects the community's stated desire to increase density in the corridor and to, as to assist the revitalization of the Pleasant Street Gateway. As a legal services attorney and a member of the Northampton Housing Partnership, I am delighted that this project will bring Northampton a substantial increase in affordable housing. Rentals in Northampton are often priced out of reach for low-income families and individuals. Indeed, I have witnessed families be evicted because their rent is often 60 and 70 percent of their family's uh, income, making their tenancies unsustainable. Families and individuals languish on wait lists for years because of the dearth of affordable housing in the Valley. The Lumberyard Project will allow more lower, more lower income families and individuals <coughs> to enjoy what we in the housing world call a high opportunity neighborhood which is one with excellent schools, infrastructure, and support. As someone who has lived in Northampton for almost 20 years, I want to welcome lower income families to have the same wonderful opportunities that I, my family and I have in the city. The Lumberyard Project will help us accomplish this and will offer incredible benefits, not just to the families who will live there, but to our entire community. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff Napolitano, did you trim that nine seconds? You'll see. You're the man. Uh, I live at 266 Grove Street, and I work for the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, as one of the sponsors for the rally on November 25th, and the person who invited Councillor Klein to speak, I'd like to clarify a few things. Uh, first, I've read the letters in the newspaper angry about Councillor Klein's comments, claim that they disrespect the city and the police department. I played her speech over and over again, and I don't think any of those folks really heard or read it, so I'm passing out a transcription of that speech. I worry about a city in which a former police officer believes that decrying the killing of an ar ar unarmed citizen is inciting the public, that a city councilor who denounces the death of unarmed black folks as a form of injustice is furthering racial tensions. Such claims are either woefully ignorant or maliciously mistaken. My opinion of the behavior of the Northampton Police Department during that rally and the impromptu march afterwards is that they were quietly and respectfully doing the best they could. They had an awkward job that night, to say the least, and they did it well. But I worry about a city in which the head of the police union denounces a city leader for stating what nearly every single person of color knows, that they have the added burden of having to teach their children about a double standard when it comes to police. That isn't the statement of a flaming radical. That's the statement echoed by our attorney general, the president of the United States, and lived by pretty much every black person in this country. 
To those whose criticism of Councillor Klein was that the parade afterwards included protesters who shouted, F the police, I'll just say that that wasn't her responsibility. A letter to the Gazette yesterday implied that it was AFSC's responsibility, that we should have exerted more discipline on the crowd. Even though there was a clear statement by the person who led folks into the street that this isn't sanctioned by AFSC, I'll accept that. I'll accept responsibility, but I won't apologize for it. Obviously, because of our practice of peace, AFSC would not have used such language. But that expression, however vulgar, is the expression of those that were shouting it. We can say what we'd like about it, but the anger behind it exists, and I can't and won't apologize for that anger. There was much focus on the well-being of the officers in the street. What strikes me is that people, the people of color, or that people of color in general, are traumatized daily. Where is the outrage on their well-being? The double standard endured by people of color is simply factually irrefutable, and I think we should be talking more about that. Northampton is an overwhelmingly white city, and we've got an overwhelmingly white police force. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It isn't an accident. There's a thread of systemic discrimination that runs through our society, so why can't we just admit that? Why can't we confront our flaws? No one is saying all police officers are racist, but we live in a racist society, so we're going to have instances of racism. Furthermore, the rally and Councillor Klein's comments, they weren't directed at the Northampton police. In her words, we as white folks must hold ourselves and those around us accountable when our humanity fails. We must work together to end the structures that allow and perpetuate racism. Councillor Klein was putting voice to the injustice that reigns in our society. She did it because it needs to be done, and we need leaders who are willing and able to call, out, uh, call it out as they are. She wasn't inciting racism that night. She was heralding a call for justice. And for that, she shouldn't be alone. She should be joined by every city leader here, everyone in this room, and everyone who cares about the health of our society. Thank you. Vanessa Lynch. Vanessa Lynch. Good evening. I, my name is Vanessa Lynch, and I'm a Northampton resident. I am here in support of Elisa Klein, um, but in support of the Black Lives Matter. But before I talk about that, I would like to briefly address what just happened um, and the fact that a white man um, basically attacked uh, a woman who was speaking. Um, and the response in the room um, was essentially nothing for a while. Um, and Martin Luther King Jr. named a big problem not as oppressors, but as people who sat quietly by while oppression was happening. Um, that is exactly what Councillor Klein was decrying when she spoke at the rally. Um, I was the person who encouraged people to march that night and led the march of over 700 people through downtown Northampton. Um, I, I will come back to the city council for a minute and say that this city council is entirely white. Um, <clears throat> As the first black woman to speak here tonight, I will say that there is a black community, there is a Latino community, there is an indigenous and there is an Asian community that is part of Northampton that is not represented here right now. So I would like to say that, name, name that issue. Um, and I would like to say that it is a base humanitarian effort of all people, and especially all white people, um, to decry white supremacy <coughs> and racism. And that every 28 hours, a black person is killed in this country by police or vigilantes. And when we march, um, it is named as violence. Um, it is the responsibility of everyone who has any kind of moral capacity, um, and especially our leaders, to stand up and stand in solidarity with black and brown people as we lead the fight for our freedom and the fight to be able to walk down the street without wondering who will kill us with impunity and then incarcerate and humiliate and, and, and criminalize our name after our death. So Councillor Klein um, is not the first person this is happening to in the Valley. Um, we saw a similar thing happening in the Holyoke with the Holyoke City Council. Um, but we, the community, will continue to march and continue to call for Black Lives Matter. And it is my hope that you became city councillors to support and represent the community. And if you do, then you will stand in support of black people saying Black Lives Matter and marching for our freedom. And you will stand in support of Elisa Klein. Um, when she supports uh, these efforts. I will also say that as a black woman in Northampton, I have been profiled and stopped by the Northampton police multiple times, um, and that we are talking about systems of oppression. And white supremacy and racism are systems that we live under daily. So when people chant FTP, when people talk about police, we are talking about the systems of oppression that allow for a black person to be killed every 28 hours and allow there to be a need for discussion about whether or not it is morally OK to decry these assassinations and this genocide. So I will conclude with saying again that I stand fully in support of Elisa Klein. And I thank you for coming and speaking that night. And I imagine that if you all have any humanity, you will do the same. Thank you.
Trevor Baptiste. Trevor? Oh, there you are. You're up front. Okay. Good evening. My name is Trevor Baptiste from um, Gulf Road in Pelham. I'm happy to be here. I'm an elected official in Pelham and the chairman of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. So I'm here to speak as power to power. I'm here to support um, uh, Alyssa Klein and uh, her efforts and what she said. And um, I think that there is a big push to put smokescreen and mirrors behind the call for Black Lives Matter. Um, I sit at an interesting nexus. I'm from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York, where um, police officers were killed a few weeks ago. I was there when we founded a black ambulance corps, the first one in the nation. It's a very obscure fact and not put in the conversation at all that the first responders for those police were black people who are police in that neighborhood that also feel that um, they want input, need input, demand input in how to police treat black people, even though they are there when the police need to get killed. Uh, uh, excuse me, when the police are hurting and killing people and the police get shot, the black ambulance corps is there to help them. Um, I will say that police are very necessary. I'm not anti-police. I'm a chairman as well, and if there's a, a disturbance in my public, I call the police. In my town, the police know me. Police are very necessary, and police are human beings like everyone else. Um, with that said, police being human, police have to be called out and um, 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 held to account to their public officials. The way this country was founded in this great um, 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 USA, in this particular place that predates our country, we decided never to have a standing army. Police are accountable to elected officials. It's the reason we allow them to walk around armed and, and enforce our rules and our regulations. If elected officials say to police, this is what we want to happen, and police are allowed to say, well, we don't want to do that, and we, don't, we think that's terrible, and you're inciting ideas. If you can't get behind being a good person and Black Lives Matter because they should, as citizens of the country, you must understand you are not going down a slippery slope to allow police to flout elected officials. You've jumped off a cliff head first. If the armed police are not held to account by elected officials, not just um, for free speech reasons, but because keeping control the, uh, 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 of the laws, the enforcement of the laws, has got to be under the control of the elected population. If that is allowed to be flouted, then we are all lost as citizens, and police can be run roughshod as bullies over anybody they decide. Black lives matter, and it just so happens because this is a racist world we live in, black lives are the least, are considered the least. So when you find bullies, they will bully the least. Now, I don't think police are all racist, but I know walking around, even as an elected official, as a black man, I'm going to find the bad ones. The bad ones will try to bully me. So with that, I want to say I, I, I'm in full support of your courageousness, and I want to match it as an elected official to speak out loud, not against any one person, but against the idea that you should not do what you're supposed to be doing as an elected official. Thank you. Manuel, you're up. You, oh, there you are. Good evening, everyone. My name is Manuel Pintado. I'm a member of First Churches of Northampton. I'm also a member of the Black Lives Matter Coalition and Just Communities. I reside at 995 North Pleasant Street, Amherst. However, my wife, Celeste Ortega, has lived here in Northampton since 1990. I want to say and believe in peace and justice. And I believe that Council, Councilor Alisa Klein has been a very special supporter. And I'm proud to say that I know uh, the Councilor. While working with Just Communities, I had the chance to meet with members of the Northampton City Council in which we were working on a trust between um, a proposal which became a city, um, executive order <laughs> For the, there can be trust between the police and the, the Northampton police and the undocumented community. Council Woman Klein was very supportive of this um, document, which, like I said, it became a executive order by Mayor Norwitz. And she also asked to be a co-sponsor of, of the order. 
I'm very supportive of Council Alexa Klein and proud to have listened to her speech, which in no way, no form, show for us to be violent against any members of society. I believe that she, as a human being and as a person, she was asking and she was feeling the pain that it is when somebody dies, especially a young person. And I believe that her speech of Black Lives Matter not only solidify what has been happening for centuries, but also shows that Councilwoman Klein is not just a leader, but she's also a human being. And being a council, I believe that the citizens of Northampton and the citizens of War 7 are very proud to have her, not only as a councilwoman, but as a leader. And I respect you for your love and dedication to your community. Thank you. And I'm uh, Sue Ann Malice Long. Did, was I even close? You'll tell me, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's okay to pick it's okay. you. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Savan Malice Long. Um, I'm actually from Amherst. Um, I live in 85 Olympia Oaks Drive. Um, I'm here because. Um, I'm here in support of um, Alyssa Klein, um, and I want to read this. This is a poster from 1851. Caution, colored people of Boston, one and all, you are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to avoid conversing with watchmen and police officers of Boston. For since the recent order of the mayor and, uh, and aldermen, they are empowered to act as kidnappers and slave catchers and they have already been actually employed in kidnapping, catching, and keeping slaves. Therefore, if you value your, value your liberty and the welfare of your fugitive among you, shun them in every possible manner. So as so many hounds in the, on the tracks of the, of the most unfortunate of your race, keep a sharp lookout f for kidnappers and have top eye open. This is from 1851. This poster, um, which which states for um, for uh, people of color to watch out for police, is still actually happening still now as a parent of a of a black child. So, um, into that, the only difference is instead instead of the word kidnapper, kidnappers, it's arrests. Instead of slaves, it's black and brown. And again, we're still targeted for even existing in the space of our cars, our streets, our job, our homes, our religion. The speech that um, City Councilor Alyssa Klein spoke on regarding black parents <coughs> talking to their children about safety, even from police, is again very much real. Um, and when there is no there is continued no accountability for justified murders of unarmed black and brown lives. Um, there is, um, sorry, I'm losing track here. Um, when there's no accountability for that, there's there's the number of 28 um, um, black and brown kids, uh, sorry, black and brown uh, folks being killed every 28 hours will rise if there is no support from leaders like yourself, um, uh, Council uh, Klein. So, in that, I want to tell a personal story where my 14-year-old, he, um, I, I never encouraged him to play with toy guns. So in this matter, it didn't, it didn't matter, uh, it, 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 it didn't matter whether or not he played with toy guns or not because look at what happened with Tamir Rice. And there's yet no accountability for his actions. So I'm calling for, for that to happen with uh, your conversations with, uh, as politicians and uh, members of the authority here. Thank you. Vera Cage. Vera Cage. <coughs> Mr. Dwight, I ask permission to share my, um, well, uh, I'd like to take up um, less than my three minutes, but also um, my colleague would like to, has signed up but has to leave early. Can he share the mic with you me? Wanna, you want to jump him up in the, yeah. Sure. That would be fine. Yeah. 
Um, so, your um, colleague? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> so, there are no motions for reconsideration in public speak time. I'm quite sure that's a rule. Go, go right ahead. So I'm, I'm Vera Cage, and I, I live in Amherst. And, um, you know, I can say, I, I can tell my address. It's 12 Longmeadow Drive, Unit 21, Amherst, Mass, 0102. Um, I had to think about it because, you know, sometimes when we speak, um, a court, you know, depending on the content, it may not be safe for us to come go back home or it may not be safe for our children to be there, um, depending upon the reactions of, of various community members. So we had one example earlier um, this meeting of um, someone shouting out an lover um, to a speaker who spoke the truth, who spoke her, her mind. And so that's the sort of um, terrorism that um, folks are confronted with and, and have to weigh, you know. Um, but for, uh, for some others, you know, it's pretty resolute what we do with our lives and our energies and, and our commitment. Um, I have children, so um, for me, um, I want to highlight what Alyssa Klein um, had mentioned in her speech um, that a retired police officer took exception to um, and wrote about in the press. Um, black parents across this country of so-called freedom and democracy <coughs> have to teach their children how to keep themselves safe from the people we're told are in our communities to protect us. But how can kids of color ever be safe in a society that relates to them as enemies of war? So um, hopefully the uh, the the discontent, um, the reaction, the, the disapproval um, that has been aired against Alyssa Klein and her <coughs> comments um, could be, is responsible for this, for this conversation that we need to have. Um, and that, you know, as a parent of color to um, black children, um, they are well aware that sometimes they're not going to be treated in a standard way um, in comparison to their white um, peers. So that's the reality, reality of it, and hopefully we can go beyond rhetoric and just address the reality um, behind the words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vera Cage is the organizer for Western Massachusetts for the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. I'll take just 30 seconds or a minute, if I might, to add this. I'm really proud to be part of this discussion tonight, both as a resident of Northampton, the record 61 Lyman Road. My name is Bill Newman. And as a member and as the director of the Western Massachusetts Office of the American Civil Liberties Union, this is a conversation that needs to happen. And it is, I just really am moved by the fact that we can have this conversation and I am moved by the content. I can't add to the eloquence of the previous speakers, but I can say that it is our obligation to confront the issues of racism. They exist in Northampton. They can be addressed in Northampton. We may not resolve them, but it is our obligation as we look at the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. It is our obligation to take on this issue. It is our obligation to do our best. And I appreciate the city councilors and the leaders of this community who say, yes, we will, and yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Peter Ives, please. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, 25 years ago, um, Rodney King was brutally beaten in Los Angeles, and that beating hit Northampton hard, and there were similar rallies to the Ferguson rally, and there was a formation of a group called the Committee for Northampton with over 100 people uh, coming to City Hall here and asking um, the council to pass a resolution asking every person in Northampton and every institution in Northampton to work on the issue of racism throughout the entire year of 1993. Um, Marianne Labarge is probably the only counselor left right now who remembers that and was and passed that vote. Um, but what it led to was a particular focus on the high school, uh, where there were issues of um, bullying, uh, 
uh, several African-American students. There was racial graffiti in the, in the uh, bathrooms of the high school. Um, and there was a climate that was very, very hard for people of color to go to school in. Um, and what happened was that by working together on the institution of the high school itself, uh, looking at the textbooks at the high school, looking at the very small number of African-American teachers, um, and, and, and what that must have meant for the African-American students who were there, um, and things like, you know, if you wanted to do a history project on Sojourner Truth, there were no books in this community in 1992 on Sojourner Truth. Um, in our public libraries, in our schools, um, there were no books on Sojourner Truth here in Northampton at that time. So what we were able to do is, as a city, begin to work on institutional racism. Um, and that concept became very, very important. So when Ferguson hit like a storm, and when you had, and thank you all who organized that rally, but when you had Alyssa Klein speaking, um, that was so important to all of us who had gone through years here of Northampton looking carefully at the institutions and institutional racism here. And as a grandfather of a African-American grandson whose father is African-American, I, uh, Alyssa, was so moved by your talk. And because every time I walk down Main Street under the bridge going towards the Bridge Street School, I wonder whether my grandson is going to be running down towards the Bridge Street School and someone's going to open up on him like a policeman. And that, that I, I, I hate that feeling. I hate that feeling. And I thank you, Alyssa, I thank you for putting that out there for all of us. You, you spoke to our hearts. Um, I also want to thank the police that night simply because when we began to, uh, 600, 700 people began to walk down Main Street and circle around by the courthouse and come back, they wove their cars um, around the crowd and they managed to direct all the traffic into the side lanes here in Northampton. And for over an hour, they managed to keep us all safe. And I feel it's very important to thank the Northampton police for the way they acted that night in terms of protecting the crowd, but not this response that has come and targeting you. Peter. Not that. I'm sorry that uh, your time elapsed some time. Oh, can I just so. make one more thing, Bill? Sure. On Martin Luther King Day, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have a forum. And Alyssa Klein will be on the forum at the Edwards Church um, at 2 o'clock. Um, Trevor Baptiste's wife who is an anthropologist at the University of Massachusetts, um, will be a member of that panel. Uh, Vanessa Lynch, wherever she is, no, she's, it, gone. she's gone. But she'll be on the panel, the leader of the Smith College, sit in uh, in front of John M. Green. Paul will be in the panel. Uh, David Sullivan, our district attorney, will be on the panel. And Russ Sinkowitz, our chief of police, will be on the panel. And it's my hope that that will help to generate a discussion that will then lead to the Human Rights Commission having you declare a larger commission the way you asked for, and for you as a city council to vote again to make the topic of eliminate racism, build community, part of our life here in Northampton. We had a banner bill on Main Street in those days. <laughs> What I did was I gave you the balance of time that uh, Councilor Newman was going to claim. So the, we're trying to achieve some parity here, please. So thank you. Um, uh, Mike Kirby is next. Mike Kirby, sir. 134 North Street, Northampton. And I'm here tonight to, to speak, I guess, for the Northampton Police Department. Nobody else is here. Um, and for Andy Tusho, who wrote this, uh, wrote this letter. Um, they've gotten hammered. They're getting hammered tonight. I had it on the occasion quite recently, 
uh, a friend of mine passed away and she told me that there were weapons in his room. It was in public housing and that the door was unlocked and there was also large amounts of cash in that room. And so I had occasion to call the, the uh, police and me and I and a police officer went and as he worked going through the closets, it's very difficult going into a person's passed away through the cartons and through, you know, through all kinds of stuff. And I realized the responsibility that was on his shoulders, okay? Found one weapon. Actually, it was a, a replica, but you'd be surprised how, how much those replicas look like real weapons without the red plug in the end of it. And I said, I thought to myself, I'm looking for the currency, okay? If I miss some, hey, no, no big deal. He's looking for a gun. And that's the kind of day-to-day -day responsibility that police officers have. And you've seen it tonight in community theater. We had community theater right here. A man getting out of control. And two minutes later, the call was, for the police to come and handle it. And so, I respect enormously Andy Trushaw, who's a retired policeman. And this letter, I have a blog, I'll, I'll plug myself, Kirby on the Loose. Um, we had an anonymous person who knew, went to, to high school with with Andy wrote, I'm a ham pie graduate and classmate of Andy Tushaw. He's a great guy, hard, hard working, trustworthy, and a decent person. His opinion matters. He worked for the city as a cop for a long time. He was one of the better ones, never pushy or arrogant, always respectful, and he tried to defuse the situation and talk to someone rather than just slap the cuffs on him or arrest him. He'd listen to people and not judge him, judge them. He deserves to be treated with respect. Um, but he isn't being treated with respect. And, Mike, and people, okay. Just to let I'm you know. I'm done. I Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Don Bianchi, please. Sure. My name is Don Bianchi. I live at 68 Laurel Park, and I also do volunteer work for Valley CDC. I am here to ask the City Council to approve Community Preservation Act funding for the Valley CDC Lumberyard Project. When built, 55 low and moderate income families will have a new home. These are our neighbors, folks who teach our children, protect public safety, serve us meals in restaurants, and clean our streets. The Northampton Housing Partnership conducted a housing needs assessment that documented the need for affordable rental housing, which this project will address. It will also provide much needed commercial space and provide the city with a mixed use building that will enhance the Pleasant Street Corridor. Valley CDC has met several times with Northampton residents and revised its building design in response to concerns expressed at these meetings. In fact, by its very nature, with the board of directors consisting of community residents, its very purpose is to serve community needs. In my job at the Massachusetts Association of CDCs, we support the work of CDCs across the Commonwealth, each one a mission-driven nonprofit organization dedicated to creating opportunities for people of diverse incomes and backgrounds so they can access housing that is affordable, benefit from economic opportunities, and fully participate in the civic life of their community. In my work, I interact frequently with the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development, which provides the funding necessary for affordable housing projects to proceed. I hear from public officials the high regard they have for Valley CDC for its commitment to providing affordable housing and for its skill in successfully developing this housing. Valley CDC's track record in receiving funding awards in highly competitive funding rounds is testament to that. 
The pre-application for the state's next funding round is expected to be due in February, and applicants must have their local funding commitments by the time they apply. Without a local commitment of CPA funds in hand prior to that date, Valley CDC will have to wait until the next round, which will likely cause a delay in the project of 8 to 12 months. Valley CDC's Lumberyard project has the unanimous support of the Community Preservation Committee, the enthusiastic support of the Housing Partnership, and support for many Northampton residents like me. I urge the City Council to approve CPA funding for this project that will provide so many benefits for so many Northampton residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jenny Ladd. Hi, I'm Jenny Ladd of 39 Row Avenue, Northampton, and I'm just here as a citizen of Northampton in support of Elisa Klein for speaking up as someone who was at the rally. Um, this feels like an extension of the rally to me. Um, I think it's all of our responsibility to stand up for this. Um, so thank you, and uh, thank you for this conversation, for all the comments that have been made before. Um, I also do want to appreciate the police on that night who really, I found, had an awkward job, as, as you said, um, and they did a good job. So thank you, and let us all stand against racism. Thank, thank you. you. Carol Reinhardt, please. I'm Carol Reinhardt, and I live at 105 Black Birch Trail, and I'm in Alyssa Klein's district, of which I am very proud, and I'm grateful, and I support you completely. You know, about 35 speakers ago, I had some really articulate <laughs> things to say. Um, and I sort of feel like just balling up the notes that I wrote, because I'm, I'm so glad I'm here to hear. And I really want to support Natalia and the Human Rights Commission's call for a commission on this and for a forum of dialogue. And I want to appreciate Mr. Kirby, who spoke his piece and I think left. Um, you know, one of the worst nights of my life was a time a few years ago when a, a, a group of four or five of us quite progressive people decided to have a conversation with an equal number of Tea Party members. I was wretched by the end. I was so accustomed to speaking to people I agree with. They had such good arguments that I had no anticipation for. If we have a commission and we have forums, please, can we find a way to listen and talk to each other? If that is the feeling that the head of the police union has about what happened, are we ever lucky he had the guts to say it? We really have to hear what each other has to say if we have any hope of coming to a place of greater understanding. <coughs> I'm glad I was here to hear. I'm very <coughs> grateful for what the police do. I rest more comfortably because they're willing to be in harm's way. I'm very grateful for what you people do as counselors for holding offices in both cases to work in the messy world of trouble and the unpredictable and the possibility that we could be more in touch with each other and have greater truth and reconciliation. Thank you. Uh, is it Kurt Ostrom? Kurt? Not here? Come on. Okay. Uh, Deborah Flynn, please. Good evening. My name is Deborah Flynn. I'm the owner of Eastside Grill on 19 Strong Ave in downtown. And I'm here for and against the new issuances of the all season liquor license. First, I'd like to say that I think that the, the five restaurants that are going for the license are excellent restaurateurs, they run great businesses, and I enjoy great competition. So I'm for the license for that purpose. What I'm against is that the fact that they're paying, the quality and the amount of money that they're paying for is cheapening the licenses that I paid for seven years ago when I bought into this community because I believe in this community and I believe in the value of what I paid for my liquor license. I also had to pledge that license against my business and my property. 
So I don't know what, what these other folks who bought liquor licenses within the past three to four years, five years, what they had to pledge, but I know that mine was a substantial amount for the business. And I don't want that to cheapen anything, and I feel like it will cheapen my license. So when I go to sell my business someday, at least I have the property to back it up. But a lot of these other restaurants might not have the property, and all they have is that business and a license that will not be valued anymore for what they paid for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ruthie Woodbring, please. Ruthie, you said there you are. I'm Ruthie Woodring, 8 High Street, Florence. Natalia said so many great things, I figured I would just go, but no, I wanted to say a few things. Um, I've been hauling trash in Northampton as part of Federal People Cooperative for the last 12 years. And I think it's great that the city is hopefully going to ban plastic shopping bags and restaurant styrofoam containers. Next, I'd like to see disposable diapers banned. <laughs> Did you know that the average baby makes 1,500 pounds of dirty diaper trash? Believe me, I've hauled it. Okay, so maybe a citywide ban isn't in the cards, but I'm just saying, if one family raised the baby with cloth diapers instead of disposables, it would save the weight equivalent of 100,000 shopping bags in the trash. I'm sure people can figure out how to manage without plastic grocery bags than disposable diapers they have for many centuries. These things are pretty recent inventions as compared to racism, which has been around since long before any of us were born. <laughs> Living in Northampton, I can't help but wonder, why are the police so white? Why is the city council so white? Why is pedal people so white? <laughs> why is Northampton so white? It's a reflection of the exclusion of people, I mean, it's many things, but it's partly a reflection of the exclusion of people who lived here before Europeans came in the 1500s. A reflection of things like the Fugitive Slave Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act, legalized segregation, and a skewed criminal justice system, and a reflection of the economic exclusion that continues <coughs> to segregate our communities today. I appreciate the council of clients willing to speak up on some of these issues. The police have a hard job, city councilors have a hard job, people of color in this community have a hard job. So my hope is that we listen to each other and slow down and take the time to See what it's like to walk in each other's shoes. So I'm not giving up my boots on this winter night. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Claudio Guerra, please. Well, there you are. You found a chair. Good, okay. <laughs> There's a chair up here. Good evening, Claudio Guerra, owner of Spoleto, Paradiso, Mami Iguanas. And I just want to say that with all these intense conversations here. I feel kind of embarrassed to talk about this trivial business thing here. So excuse me, guys, I'll make it real quick. <laughs> I'm here and speaking in opposition of uh, the five licenses being uh, uh, given away in comparison to what everyone else has paid for. I just wanted to mention that I was going to put my name in the hat originally to, because I, I would have liked to have converted Pizzeria Paradiso, a beer and wine license, to an all alcohol license. But I personally, this is the kind of guy I am, believe it or not, <laughs> decided, you know what, as much as that would be a great thing, it's, there's much better uses for that license by getting another new business in or something like that. So I decided just on ethical reasons just to not uh, put my name in the hat. Well, now I'm kicking myself. Had I, maybe you guys would have decided to give six away instead of five, and then I'd be really happy. <laughs> so that's my only point. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Uh, is that Fred? Fred? That's me. Fred Gore, thank Fred you. Gore. Thank you. Sorry. Well, I'm Fred Gore. I live at 50 Walnut Street in Northampton. Uh, I'm co owner and general manager of Fitzwillis. Uh, and I'm also here to talk about the liquor licenses. Uh, I oppose the. Um, the issuance of these licenses on, for, for a few different things. I mean, I think it has to be looked at a couple different ways. What, what does issuing these licenses do to the city? Uh, for, what, what does it do for the city or, or what does it do to hurt the city? Uh, and what does it do um, to help or hurt existing business owners? Um, you know, the, the city, the city of Northampton is great. It's growing, I think. Um, it, it's a great place to own a business. The restaurant community is great. Uh, soon we're going to be dealing with the casino, uh, and I understand you folks saying, "Boy, we have to we have to find ways to bring more people to Northampton so they don't go to the casino." Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure more, more liquor licenses is the way to do that. Uh, I think adding six more licenses um, is simply <laughs> going to uh, take the existing amount of business and spread it among six more liquor licenses. I don't think the, um, the city coffers is going to see a benefit in the um, in increased tax income, uh, the three quarters of the percent local meals tax, uh, because I think we're, we're just going to spread it around a little bit more. So I, I don't see the benefit to the city. Um, as far as the de detriment to the local um, current license holders, um, we've owned our license since 1988. Uh, I look at folks like Matt Gibbs over at the One Bar and Grill or Jeremiah, uh, you know, they bought their licenses within the last year and paid paid big money, some up, up near $150,000. Um, I had one fellow uh, uh, whose name I won't mention who, who came to me and said, Fred, if, well, if they do this, uh, the, the license of that value is 60, 70 percent of my personal net worth. Uh, and if you folks decide to do this and devalue the, those licenses, um, I mean, you're hurting people that have invested money and time. Um, and, and work and energy into making the restaurant scene in this city what it is. Um, so um, again, I just I, ha I have to voice my opposition. Uh, what I would ask you folks to do would be don't take the second vote tonight. Uh, let's let's talk about this some more. Let's open this up to a public hearing. Um, I think more restaurant people need to be heard from. I think more Northampton residents need to be heard from. Um, I think this is this whole process is just moving along too fast. Um, and that's it. Uh, and in closing, I just want to say uh, thank you to Chief Sinkowitz and the entire Northampton Police Force. Uh, they, do, they have a hard job to do. I think they do it well. I know when we need them uh, downtown, we call them. They're there. They respond. Um, Councilwoman Klein, I don't disagree with a thing you said, but I think we've got to give the police department its due as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Mary Finn. Mary Finn. I'm Mary Finn. I own 274 Pleasant Street in Northampton. <coughs> I'm an abutter to the Lumberyard proposed project. I want to state before the council and members of the community that I do support affordable housing. I do support development on the Lumberyard property, and I think the two would be a good fit. I think a mixed-use affordable housing project would work on that location. What I object to is the CPA funding for the structure that's being proposed. There were factors that were not considered that should have been. There's still time to do that. Yes, the CBAC has issued a permit with typical conditions. The CBAC addressed issues regarding the facades of the building facing Holyoke Street and facing Pleasant Street. They mistakenly thought that they couldn't address the exterior walls and the design of the middle portion of the building. The middle portion of that building will be visible from the other side of the railroad tracks and from Pleasant Street. And anyone coming up or down Pleasant Street is going to see the gray cement siding on that building because of its height and its mass. I realize tonight that you're not voting on the building design. You're voting on whether to use CPA funds to support this proposed building. It is your task to spend those funds only on projects that are harmonious in size and scale with the community. You cannot just defer and say the CBAC issued a permit. They mistakenly did not look at the whole of that building as it's written in the ordinances and as it's written in the city design guidelines. Tonight, you must vote against appropriating the CPA funds for the structure, or at least defer the second reading until you can better understand how this building should have been looked at in its entirety. We need a structure that meets the criteria to be awarded CPA funds. It is possible in this location to do that. We don't have it yet. I would ask you to take a first reading tonight and defer that second reading. You can have a design that will work really well for 100 years. When you have, I would be pleased and I would enjoy watching you fund it. 
until we have it, this is not the right thing to do. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Matt Mac Everett, 40 Valley Street. Um, I, at the risk of repeating, I'm going to go ahead with some comments that I wrote this afternoon. And I apologize if they're uh, redundant, but I feel strongly about them. I attended the rally November 25th. Uh, coming in the wake of the Michael Brown and Eric Garner deaths, it gave people a chance to assemble, to vent grief and, yes, anger in a nonviolent manner. I commend the Northampton police for their professionalism that night. They exercised restraint in not reacting to some obscene chanting and for allowing the spontaneous march to happen that night. To me, those were examples of good judgment by our police in the heat of the moment. I also commend Councillor Klein for having had the courage to speak out against institutional racism, a persistent nationwide blight on our values. Sadly, it's an issue that still infects many public and private institutions, and it's not going away without everyone, especially community leaders, recognizing it and expressing strong objection to it and working to end it. That's exactly what Elisa Klein was doing that night. I don't believe she was singling out police, let alone Northampton police, for that scrutiny. Back to obscene chanting by some in the crowd. Personally, I don't think that's a constructive response, but I understand it was born of deep frustration and that it is protected by free speech, which is what the officers present did to their credit. And in the end, after all the speeches, no rocks were thrown, no windows broken, no cars torched, no blows exchanged or shots fired led by Ms. Klein and others, an aggrieved group of citizens assembled and expressed justified outrage in a nonviolent way. I'm proud she is an elected leader in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wait till my three minutes gets up. Oh, I've, I'm already counting down, no, and no, I just no, no, got no, here. Just, You're always <laughs> trying to no, make no, my life that's difficult, that's Bill. That's <laughs> the remainder of Max okay, time. Very good. So, oh, very good. Yes, it, we're Claudia left Forty state. Valley Street. I'm a little over, you know, cooked here with the heat. Um, I'm here basically to thank Elisa as a public official for standing up and saying what she said at the rally and also to say it's disappointing that the rest of you, except for now I see that the um, Pam uh, Hunt, what is uh, the school committee woman whose name, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, has written a letter on her behalf. I think it's, uh, the silence is deafening and I think the mayor and the rest of you have something to say about this issue which we are all here to say so much about but we also would like to hear from you. So I don't want to repeat what's been said. This is a very heavy issue. I'm going to take my time to speak about something that is another issue that's connected to this and that is the war in Iraq. Tomorrow is the, is, marks the anniversary of the bombing in Jan, uh, January 17th that began the first Gulf War in 1991, which nobody remembers, which began the destruction. Somehow this, is, this period between 1991 and 2003 has gone missing from the history books. But this was the beginning of the end for Iraq. And it's not an issue that's disconnected. I mean, as everyone knows, we, the vigil stands every Saturday. And, and we've been... There have not been city officials joining us in this vigil, and I'm offering this assessment, this new invitation, in this new atmosphere that's saying we should all be standing, we should all be speaking respectfully about issues that are of grave concern. And so I'm here to remind people of the, this anniversary coming up tomorrow and to do some reflection on how far racism can go, what we have actually done in the name of racism to people in Iraq. And thank you. Thank you. Time. Mr. Roy C. Mark. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. My name is Roy C. Martin, 81 Conn Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, tonight, I come before you, right? Well, first, I'd like to speak on behalf of the police department. You know, for years, right, I was on both sides of the law, right? You know, I got, I got dents in my head where they hit me with nightsticks and stuff. 
threw me in the back of the paddy wagon, right? Hauled me off to the clink because I was drunk, right? And I was disorderly. Hey, right? Then, you know, I, I had it coming. Uh, I've been sober for 20 years, right? Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Bob, right? And uh, thanks to the VA. Now, right, uh, having said that, right, I think that each and every one of you are elected to, and when you take that off, you take that off, not to cause, cause no harm. Now, when you cause no harm, when you're speaking, uh, the way you're speaking, right, like Lisa Klein there spoke on behalf of her district, right, or on behalf of the whole city, right? Now, me as one person in the city, didn't quite feel that way. I don't feel that the police department in this city, right, is bad at all. And, uh, you know, right, a lot of the police department has been real good to me. You know, they, they treated me good. And uh, after all the years of mistreatment they took from me, so, right, I can't, I can't condemn them for anything, right? And uh, as far as, uh, you know, as far as racism in this city, right, I see less in this city than I've seen in any city by any police department, right? You know, uh, you go to Boston, right? You want to talk racism, go to Boston, right? And places like that. So I don't think that having, you know, having a demonstration like they had was something that really wasn't, it wasn't necessary in this town, right? It started a lot of bad feelings, both sides, and of course, right, it didn't really start the bad feelings in the upper districts, like up on Elm Street. It started the bad feelings, right, in the projects and places like that. Places where I go, where I find out, where I listen, right, where I understand these people. They understand me, they talk to me, they tell me. All right, so that caused a lot of problems between the police department and people there. I, uh, I know, I live at 81 Con Street, right? We have our own little problems with racism and terrorism, right, from a few people. So, with that said, now, all right, the last thing that I want to say real quick, all right, all of you people were elected. All of you people went last year and said, oh, we got to have a prop two and a half. We're going to lose school teachers. We're going to lose this. We're going to lose that. We can't pay the police department. We got to fire our police, all right? So, you get a, get a prop two and a half elected, and then what happens? This year, you hire six cops, you hire police firemen, you hire DPW, you hire all over the place. You, the mayor's got three secretaries, right? You know? Well, you do. I, I know, right? I know, right? My time is up, but I mean, you know, hey, my time is always up. When I ran for mayor, my time was up, right? Got it. No, thank you. Have a good one. Everybody have a good one. Uh, Jeremiah Micka, please. How are we doing today? My name is Jeremiah Micka. I'm uh, owner of Union Station, uh, Platform Sports Bar, The Deck Bar, and Tunnel Bar. Um, I was one of the more recent people to buy a liquor license, and I just want to make a couple of points. I'm going to be pretty quick, and then I was going to share the time with uh, John Newman, if that's okay. Um, so some of the points are the value of our license is obviously going to decrease. Um, it's unfair to everybody who paid the full price. I think taking, you're taking away a major competitive advantage that we have, which is selling liquor over just beer and wine. Um, there's a quota in place and it's based on population. Um, and we're already over that quota, so adding four more licenses on top of the one that we've already given is, is definitely not going to help us at all. Um, I think prior to the lottery that took place for the other license, um, this would never even be an issue. I think it would never have been brought up. Um, so I'm sad that that's happened. Um, and then I have a couple of questions for you. Um, who's going to stop the applicants from selling their, um, their liquor license in the future? It could be two months from now. They can make a profit. Walk, oops, sorry. Walk away. Um, and where is it going to stop? Is every applicant who applies from here on out going to be able to get a liquor license? And those people who are going to get this liquor license, um, what side of the fence are they going to be standing on when that comes up? And then I want you to put, put yourself in my shoes. I paid $150,000. Five other people are going to get it for $15,000. And I want you to ask, is this fair? Thank you. Thank you.
You, you have half the time. Left. That's all I need. Yeah, okay. My name is John Newman. I own JJ's Tavern in Florence. I uh, just opened up 18 months ago. Again, like all these other guys said, um, I'm against this, uh, this vote here tonight. Um, we paid over $100,000 for our liquor license. Um, and I'm just afraid my personal situation uh, that, you know, that it's like real estate, you know, if, if the bank, you know, that value, that license was based on, you know, my loan and my getting, starting my business, which I invested into this town. And uh, if, if they take another look at, at my loan, you know, loan to value ratio, and they say, well, you know, your, your value used to be 100,000 or 150,000 for this license, now it's 10, 15, 20,000, and they say, well, you know, you don't meet the criteria for, for this loan, and they ask me for a bunch of money to come up with it. If I can't come up with it, am I out of business? I mean, it's, it's a tough situation. I mean, um, I, I support all these guys and all the businesses in town. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's tough to, uh, you know, to the equal playing field, and I, I understand the reasons why these licenses are in place, but, um, you know, we, we worked hard to get this license. Uh, we worked for years going through the town, going through the ABCC to get this license, and uh, we just want to see it, uh, it's, it it'd be as strong as it, as, as it is in the town, so. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Roth, please. Uh, my name is Barry Roth. I live at 88 Acrebrook Drive in Florence. I'm here uh, because I'm actively involved in trying to create open space within the city of Northampton, and I feel that uh, the CPA money that should be shared uh, for that goal is being misused and misappropriated by an imbalance being spent on uh, sub sub subsidized housing. Um, while I have no personal preference for the project, uh, the VCDC project on Pleasant Street, um, as to whether it's good or bad, I'm not going to argue that one way or the other. But I do feel that the use of CPA money, Community Preservation Act, is being uh, misused as a down payment. Uh, very specifically, the facts that the City Council has been given to evaluate this by the Mayor and by the City Planning Director, at least the hard copy, printed copies that I have seen, are inaccurate and therefore do not give you a fair uh, um, criteria of evaluating this. <clears throat> very specifically, the Mayor says that this project will bring in $100,000 in tax dollars. That simply is not the case. Um, and uh, Wayne, F as Wayne Fiden originally said, that the, this project designed for families will have about six children living in it. The reality is he subsequently changed that and said using a formula will have 20, 20 children. If you actually consider the cost of educating a student, 20 students at 12000 comes to $250,000 a year. That's the reality. The city already has 12% uh, affordable subsidized housing. It's great. We all want it. I want it. I lived in rent control places. I know how important it was for me at a certain point in life. But this is a small community. We're not rich people. So I think it's wrong. I think you have to hold off on a vote to evaluate just what the cost will be. I can't find any money for open space for protecting the wildlife. And where I see this grand shifting of money to one goal of subs uh, of creating affordable housing, it's not fair to the rest of the community and the rest of the needs of the community. And I think if you just, I, I work all, all day long, I've seen the, the uh, taxes double in the last 10 years, and I, I believe that there has not been a proper accounting of affordable housing. It's great, but there are, there are other ways of keeping, keeping in place. And I will do, I hope to write an article, submit it to the Gazette. Um, I'm a little bit too nervous to, uh, to go on, but I think I ask you to hold and, and let's get all the information and then use your, use your wisdom. But let it be based on facts, not on misinformation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, Bill Newman already spoke. So J.P. Kaczynski, J.P., are you still here? There you are. Hi, how are you doing? You all right? I apologize. I've been my first day out after surgery. Um, I haven't been out since the last year. <laughs> I've been at Cooley Dickinson. Thank, thank God for Cooley Dickinson for the, for the help that I received. Uh, we're on the mend, but I, this is an important time. I want to say I do certainly support Melissa Klein and the efforts of the police department and the council to get together 
and have your discussions. Best thing that could happen. On the issue of salary of the council, whatever you need. <laughs> this is, you guys work so hard. As a fellow councilor from another community, I've had the opportunity to vote for CPA projects. I am a CPA fan. I still want to meet the person who invented the CPA. It's the greatest thing since apple pie. I voted in favor of affordable housing. I voted in favor of open space and historic preservation. I do require high quality standards for these projects. And I think we're a little short in this regard at this time on this particular project for the lumber yard. I'll speak to parking just briefly because I think quality affordable housing ought to guarantee the residents that they have parking for their cars. There's no such guarantee in this project. In fact, there are commercial spaces in addition to the 55 residential spaces. People work. They have to get to work. They got to put the car somewhere. They ought to have the right in a quality affordable housing project to have a place to park. Maybe that's too much to ask for. What about process? You've heard from many people that the process was lacking. The process should be strong if you're going to support with CPA funds. This property went under deposit in April of 2013. <coughs> that's right, 2013. 18 months later, was the first time the community, to my knowledge, was asked to participate in the process of which your CPA funds are going to be used. Something's missing in, in the process. What happened during that 18 months? The safety of the children. This is a one, two, and three bedroom unit project. As far as I know, there's no playground for the children on the, on the site. A quality, affordable housing project ought to have a playground, ought to have a place for the kids that's safe, not to go into the streets and not to play on the railroad tracks. I looked the other day and found that uh, or today there's 53 units of housing on the market, single family in Northampton. You could buy every single one at full price and not spend the money you're going to spend on this project. Do the math. $20 million, 55 residential, two commercial units, 57 units, that's over $350,000 per apartment. The average single family tax bill, tax, uh, the average single family value, assessed value in Northampton, if I'm not mistaken, is about $301,000. Your constituents deserve a quality project. I think you need to look for another project or to make this one better. I urge you not to vote CPA funds at this time. Thank you. Maddie Weaver Blanchett. Hi, I'm Maddie Weaver Blanchett, and I live at 41 Valley Street. I'm the neighbor to the lumber yard. And I'm here tonight because I'm a strong supporter of the affordable housing on the lumber yard site. And I ask that you please release the CPA funds for that project. Um, I want to say my time isn't ticking, just to let you know. Oh, very honorable of you. I am very honorable. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I, I can say some brief things. Um, you know, I, I, I've participated in the Pleasant Futures Forum, which is about redeveloping Pleasant Street. I believe that um, what neighbors said during that forum is really in concert with this project. It's about people living there, people working there. It's about uh, a pedestrian access. It's about um, trees and uh, a reuse of these sites. So I think it's very much in concert with that. Again, also I've been to public forums uh, about the new development on 33 Holly Street, which is going to be a big art center, which is going to be affordable um, space for artists to create work. Uh, and again, at a lot of those forums, this question comes up, housing, 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 what about housing for artists? So, you know, I think everybody in this room knows that um, there has been a mass exodus of lower income people to more affordable communities 
in East Hampton and Holyoke, and I, for one, think that's a tremendous loss to our community. And um, uh, you know, I think that this starts to this is something that's a hedge against that. But I also just want to say I'm a very practical person. I'm hearing a lot tonight about justice, about exclusion. To me, affordable housing on Pleasant Street is our opportunity to create social, more social justice in Northampton. It's a simple way that today we can invite people, we can hold people, and we all know in this room that those are going to be people that are more representative of people of color than you know, the projects that are going on at Village Hill and Clark School that are going to be very wealthy uh, projects for wealthy people. So I mean, I just say, like, let's just be honest about this. This is an easy way for us to do something uh, about pro problems that people are talking about in these national ways and global ways. Well, let's give kids and single people who work safe housing with access to good schools, just like my sister Jennifer Derringer spoke earlier, you know, the benefits that why I'm here while we're all here. And, you know, I read an article that 12 out of 20 of the poorest schools in Massachusetts are in our neighboring communities of Holyoke and Springfield. Meanwhile, my children have attended Northampton High School, which is some sort of machine of pumping children out into top tier and Ivy League schools. So I say, Northampton, let's make some room at the end. Here's the chance. Mm -hmm. And you have the honor of being the last person who was signed up. Um, I, I almost hesitate, but I am honor bound to offer anyone who has not an opportunity to speak, uh, to speak now. Um, I see a taker, uh, Jasper. Uh, you raised your hand. It was a dead giveaway. So, I... You have to identify yourself, please. Yes. My name is Jasper Lapienski. Yes, I rode my bicycle here. I now live at Village Hill. Vicinity. Um, and thank you to the mayor for plowing the bike trails. So here's the thing. I plan to come and sort of angrily denounce the police. And I'll do that briefly. I think it's shameful that any police officer or police representative would say anything about their elected officials. Most people would get fired if they spoke that way about their boss, and they should be fired. Uh, I plan to say happy things about Elisa Klein. I think she's a great city councilor. Um, but something happened at the beginning of this meeting that I want to address. The person who caused a disturbance, um, his name is Ed. He's not a friend of mine. We're formerly acquaintances, but he's not around much anymore. He's a Vietnam veteran. He suffers severely from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, he's not a racist. He just sort of hates the world because he's in so much pain all the time. And if anyone's lives don't matter in our society, especially at the hands of the police, it's the mentally ill who are given drugs and not treatment. Um, also, for what it's worth, he was referred to as white. He's not white. He's Jewish, and members of his family are either Holocaust survivors or narrowly escaped. I, I don't remember which. Um, so I don't entirely agree with Elisa Klein's comments. I think they were very important, and I don't think that the police should have any right. And by, by the way, the city council can pass a resolution tonight in new business demanding that the mayor fire any police officer who who uh, trashes a member of elected government in the same way that President Obama fired General Stanley McChrystal. Right? This is something that happens. You don't speak negatively about elected branches when you hold a gun. Um, but we should be careful about who we include, who we exclude. My take on that situation is that Ed felt that because he was not black, his victimization by, I don't know what police department, was not valued. And I think there's some truth to that. Uh, so I, I'm not sure where to conclude on that. I don't support his behavior. I can't speak for it. Um, but I wanted to address what happened since I, since I have some information and since I didn't feel that he was completely off the mark, even if his approach was. Thank you. Thanks. 
Yeah, if, they, if is that it? Is, is everyone spoken their piece? I really appreciate your time. Um, before we convene, I'm actually going to recommend a recess for the council to uh, get their wits about. Thank you all very much for your participation. I appreciate it very much. Do you want something? I'm going to get a slide going to. Yeah. Welcome back. Uh, we're coming out of recess, and we're actually, we haven't even convened the meeting yet. It's 9 o'clock. Um, <laughs> so, in the interest of getting things moving, let's get to work. Uh, I will ask the secretary to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shearer. Here. We do have a quorum, and we may convene and get to work, but uh, it should be noted that Councilor Murphy and Councilor Specter are absent with excuse. Um, I, there's, uh, I, my first up actually, I'm going to announce that there is a uh, public hearing scheduled for uh, February 5th, 2015 in these chambers uh, starting at 7.05 for a national grid poll petition for Burn Cult Road. Um, so be advised, put it in your calendars, set the date. Uh, we actually had two things that were up that were scheduled in the agenda for folks who were reading the agenda. Uh, both have been postponed. Uh, one was one of the was a presentation from the City of Northampton's Information Technology Assessment. Um, we will be able to hear from that about that on February 5th. Am I correct? And also, there was supposed to be a recognition of the annual DPW Employee of the Year recognition. But we went past his bedtime, and so uh, we will uh, give him proper and due recognition on the fifth as well. Uh, Your Honor, do you have any other communications at, at this time? Okay. We have no proclamations, resolutions, recognitions, but we do, might have one minute announcements. Council have one minute announcements. No. Uh, uh, licenses and petitions. We have a petition, a petition for a, a taxi cab license, and this is for Cosmic Cab of 78 Con Street. And the owner is Jeffrey Miller of 3 Market Street in Northampton. I know that Jeffrey's been here in the past. I don't see him here tonight, though, but um, I'll accept a motion for the petition. So moved. Second. Second. Um, discussion on the petition? Uh, Cosmic Cab has, has met all the taxes and all the all the requirements, and in point of fact, actually seems to be a burgeoning uh, uh, transportation system here in Northampton. Um, okay, all those in favor of accepting the petition, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, it passes. Next up is a petition to accept as a public roadway uh, Scanlon Avenue, and this comes with a positive recommendation from the Board of Public Works and the Planning Board. Uh, accept a motion for that. Move to approve. Our second. Okay. Uh, discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, and actually now I'd like to beg the council's indulgence and given the fact that there are people who've been sitting here for a very long time or uh, relative to two specific issues, I'd ask that we move the uh, compensation uh, up and as well as the, um, the uh, CDC award to the next items on the agenda if, without objection. Is that okay? Do you have a preference which you want to address first? CDC. CDC? Okay. The CDC award, that's under um, orders. And that's number, that's C, I think. No, that's, I'm sorry, that's not. That's under uh, financial orders. And that should be. It's G under number uh, 10G. Right. 10G. We all up to speed here. This is this is. Uh, I'll set the motion to put on the floor the second reading for motion to put it on the floor. 
Second. First read. Uh, just a question. I'm sorry, first read. First, That's right. first read, correct. I'm sorry, uh, do, uh, Councillor Carney? I just had a question about whether it was the first reading. Because I it, is, it is indeed the first reading. I'm sorry, my bad. Move to approve. Okay, so the motion's been made and it's been seconded and it's on the floor. Um, discussion. Now, I know there's discussion, so <laughs> no one has to be shy. You want to start? I will um, say, okay. Um, I did attend, I, I actually moved that we postpone this discussion from the last council meeting um, pending the community meeting that was scheduled for uh, December 29th as a um, prerequisite of the CPC funding. Um, and then the follow-up, uh, oh, still then open public hearing at the planning board and central business architecture. I was able to attend the uh, community meeting among uh, with uh, most of the councilors who are here tonight. So um, I, I want to preface my remarks by saying that um, I felt that there was a vast consensus among all of those present that the mission of the project of the CDC to provide affordable housing, to use that space for affordable housing, was a, um, was a noble and worthwhile and consistent uh, goal, one consistent with the sustainable Northampton and um, one shared by all of those, even those who continue to vehemently oppose the current project. Um, my continued hesitation to support at this point is for is because this is really while this is an allowable project under uh, the planning board and while it did um, receive the approval that was necessary by the planning board and the central business architecture we're talking about the cpa funding at this point and i find it difficult um, to approve the cpa funding in the face of continued vehement opposition of the neighboring businesses, uh, those that spoke tonight, uh, Dr. Mary Beth Urban, uh, Mary Finn, who have uh, the optical studios, um, Councillor Krasinski, who also spoke with property in that, in that area, they, the property owners that I heard at the um, community meeting, some who could not be present because it was at the, in the middle of the holiday season. And some of that really speaks um, to the regrettable fact that this is really only 10 weeks past when some of those businesses were first um, were, were first made outreach to. Uh, that was 10 weeks ago rather than as, as has been suggested 10 months ago, which might have made this a much, a much more um, workable situation, a situation where maybe some of those things, even those things that were referenced tonight, such as the brick facade of the vast mass of the concrete. There are just a number of things there that continue to make it a very um, difficult uh, project for me to support at this point. And, and it's not because I don't, as I said earlier, completely support the goals of affordable housing, of affordable housing on that site, as do those folks who, who I've heard say that they object to the process their involvement in the process, the short amount of time. So it's, um, it's actually, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I'm, not, I'm not extremely comfortable objecting, but I do feel that it's necessary for me to voice my objection and vote in opposition tonight on this matter. Um, it should also note that the uh, chair of the Community Preservation Committee is available if you want to recognize him for questions relative to the award and, and the way it was uh, come to uh, Council LaBarge. Thank you. Um, I attended that meeting also on December 29th. And previous to that meeting, I brought it up at City Council. We were doing the first vote. And I thought that it was very unfair for us to do that first vote because that hearing was coming up on December 29th. And to me, that was very valuable to make sure that at least I was going to be there to hear what some of the owners or, or butters had to say. For the 17 years that I've been a city councilor, I have supported every 
affordable housing that has come to City Council. And the same with you, Councilor Carney. You always have. There's something about the process that's really, really bothering me. I'm not happy with it. I really, really, really have to feel, and I've dealt with a lot of residents on my ward. They're not from Ward 3. But I feel this is an issue for every taxpayer here in the city of Northampton. That a hearing, a full hearing, should have been held either somewhere at, at JFK or wherever so taxpayers could come in and also voice themselves on a public hearing of how they felt about that development that's occurring. I also feel that they should have the rights to that because that CPA money is coming out of their pockets. I'm just concerned about the process itself. We did hear somebody say something about there was no playground. There is a playground. There's no question about it because I brought it up at that meeting. In regards to that, I was concerned about the size of the playground. I think at that meeting we were also told that they had lowered the height of the building from, I think it was, what, 54 down to 44 on, on the footage part of it, and plus putting in the, um, the windows have been changed and so forth. But I'm very, very concerned about the process, and I know, Counselor, this really bothers me because it's the process of what has been and what we're hearing from business owners, and I'm concerned about that. And I think this first reading, and we should not be doing a second reading tonight, which I'm hoping we're not, to give ourselves another couple of weeks to let business owners come in and talk. Let's have a meeting. Let's have a meeting citywide. That's what I feel that should be done. And let people be able to say what they would like to say. I. I cannot support this. The first time I have never supported affordable housing. I like mix. I really like mix because I think just having affordable is not enough. I would like to see that mix. We have a mix right over there on um, the ice pond, which I think is probably one of the best developments that ever was placed in the city where you have affordable and where you have people who are very well to do. We have two developments we're going to be looking at at Pleasant Street. Yes, I know um, parking, transportation has nothing to do with this application. I know that we're looking at roundabouts off a of Damon Road and around by the Bowling Alley area around that. But what about Main Street and coming in to Pleasant Street? That's another issue that I have. When we have two developments that are going to be constructed. I, I'm just not happy about the process itself. I, I think we need some time here to really bring in the business owners and the community. Even though you've had meetings in Ward 3 and that, this has become a serious issue for me. The calls, the emails that I have gotten, I have to say Valley CDC, Joanne has done an excellent job. I have to say Peg Keller, Carolyn Mish, Wayne Fiden, but I'm just not supportive of what is occurring with this development. And believe me, I was down there this week three times looking at that site, and I'm just not happy with the process on it. I, I just feel that transparency, yes, occurred on Ward 3, but not enough for me for all the taxpayers in the city. Thank you. Um, was there an interest in recognizing Don Meyer? Uh, I move to recognize Second. Mr. Meyer. Uh, all those in favor of recognizing Downey Meyer, please say aye. 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 Uh, Downey, maybe it'd be helpful if you explain the process of uh, CPC and, and mandates and requirements. Well, um, again, in, in terms of process, I just want to, I'm not sure how many people read the Gazette these days, but this is a Wednesday, October 16th, 2013 article. 
the Valley Community Development Corp is eyeing the site of a former lumber yard on Pleasant Street downtown for development of 60 units of affordable housing. The nonprofit recently received a $1.1 million loan from the Community Economic Development Assistance Corp, a state development finance institution, to help it acquire the Northampton Lumber property at 256 Pleasant Street. Valley CDC's plans call for construction of a four-story, handicapped accessible building on the 1.23 acre site. So again, this is, you know, I'm on the Conservation Commission, I'm also a member of the school committee, and I understand that when there is significant change in a community, that it's very hard to satisfy people that they've been included from the very beginning of the process. But I, I just want to point out that, um, Councilor Barge, when you said there should have been a meeting at JFK, that we as part of the Community Preservation Committee, um, we have hearings and we hold, you know, we have public comment and we have a meeting that is specifically for public comment where we listen and we don't speak. Um, and there's a presentation made by the applicants, um, again, that, that people are free to comment. And actually, in terms of our procedure, we actually allow people in the audience to interact with the applicants. So if you come to a CPC meeting, and actually this happened for, you know, this has happened before, it will happen in the future. If you had a question, for instance, for Valley CDC, for Joanna, she was presenting the project, we would allow you to ask that question so that you would be satisfied that, you know, if you wanted the information, you could get it. And, and I know that just in terms of um, what's happened as this has gone along, when we required the public meeting that many of you attended, um, what we did not want to do was add another layer of process to what we thought already was an adequate process in the city of Central Business Architecture Committee review and of Planning Board review. But we did want to make sure that the residents, and not just the direct abutters, but the entire community had an opportunity to be informed what, about what was going forward so that when they went actually to the decision makers, to you, who are voting on the CPA funding tonight, um, to the CBAC, to the planning board, that they would be fully informed. And so that if they made criticisms, they would be making criticisms on the most current information. So I, I think as, as chair of the CPC, I think that my committee has made our very best efforts with this application as we've done with other applications to try to give residents and this council the proper context, which is why I also provide you with information, um, you know, further information since the last time was before this council on cost control and costs of public housing, which I know people are always concerned. Um, I know there was public comment tonight about, you know, the per unit cost. Um, unfortunately, again, I think it's important to point out that we don't have $20 million to spend on buying units of housing. That might be a great model if we had $20 million in our budget to go and purchase homes around the city and give them um, to families that need affordable housing. We don't have that money. That money is being, if it is granted, granted by the Department of Housing and Community Development, and they define the rules of the game here. And again, that's why I sent you that qualified allocation plan, because that's what Valley CDC has to abide by in planning this project. Um, it reminds me a little bit of people talking about if I was the coach of the Patriots. Um, I think it's sometimes very easy to say what decisions you would make if you were a developer in this situation, but Valley DC has a track record of winning awards not, not because they stumble into them. It's extraordinarily competitive and they get there because they understand what the Department of Housing and Community Development is trying to do with housing. And one of the things this year, one of the priorities right there in black and white is housing for families. It's larger unit size. And as good as the HAP project is, it doesn't have that. It has single bedroom and studio. And this is the only project that's adding housing for families in our community. The council right. On the agenda, it states that the council is asked to consider two readings if the deadline for the project submission to the state requires local funding commitment in place before February 5th. Is that the case? Um, uh, staff for our committee has been in communication with Valley CDC. Uh, it would be possible for you to do a first reading tonight and to do another reading. Um, they think that that would not affect their ability to get the application in for the DHCD um, you know, round. And again, I think it's important you know, to not make this a rush process, again, to allow maximum participation, maximum information to go out. So whereas they would be happier with a commitment earlier, they're comfortable with it 
going forward at a second reading at the February meeting. Let me clarify. I don't ask for postponement because I don't have any interest in postponement. Right. My point is that this needs six votes to pass. Two are in opposition, I believe, from listening to this vote. Right. It sounds like it would fail if this vote was taken. So it, 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 is, is it correct that it needs six votes to pass? That is my understanding. So, I mean, it, it, may, not, it, may, it may not survive first vote. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments? Uh, Councilor Klein. Um, yeah, I have been uh, reading a lot about this, talking to a number of residents, actually, of Ward 3 that are neighbors of the, um, the property and have actually come to the conclusion that we do need to move forward with this. And I do plan on voting yes if this goes to vote tonight. Um, I think that it would be a really serious missed opportunity to not be able to um, create affordable housing in our community for families especially, as uh, Downey has pointed out. Um, I think that there may be things that could use tweaking um, in terms of how it looks, how it fits into the, the buildings right next to it. I don't think that we necessarily don't have time to make some of those tweaks, but I think it would be a really big missed opportunity for Northampton to create um, affordable housing for families in need, and uh, I would support this. Councilor O'Donnell. Um, just an inquiry on Councilor Adams' point. Um, there are seven members here tonight, and so I would think five votes would be sufficient. It should be. It's two thirds, yeah. yeah. It's a two thirds right. vote on yeah. community. I thought six was required. Uh, it's five. I thought six was required. I'd like to be comfortable with this. Yeah. Um, Isn't it five? Just so we're clear. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Isn't it five? Isn't six votes, I believe. But, um, yes, Pam's doing the math for me now. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I only have a GED. I, a I don't know what to say. I just, so, it's a, so a two-thirds um, two vote is required on? It's, a, it's an appropriate. Right. It's, appropriate. It's, an it's an appropriation. appropriation. It's an authorization of appropriation. So it needs okay. to. Uh, Thank you. <coughs> Six votes. Yeah, Councilor Adams points out that he does. Six yeah. So six votes are required in order. <coughs> so, uh, did you have any other comments? Of I, I I do have a, a general comment on this, and um, the first thing I'll say is I appreciate the thoughtful comments of Councilor Carney and, and Councilor LaBarge. Um, you know, I don't think anyone doubts for a minute your commitment to affordable housing. Um, but I want to I want to address an issue that I've heard a little bit tonight on the council floor in public comment, also in the most recent community meeting, um, which is the idea that um, this project is going to be right downtown, and somehow that is um, uh, not an asset; that that's somehow a bad thing. And um, you know, I was sort of reflecting. This is a little indulgent, but I'm going to I'm going to do it anyway. Um, because uh, the uh, former governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, died this year on, on New Year's Day. And he was um, someone who I admire very much and someone who uh, is often quoted, and I think for good reason. And I'd like to quote just three sentences from him from his most famous speech. Um, it's so often quoted, it's probably a cliche by now. But um, it's when he was talking about um, this metaphor that President Reagan used to use of a shining city on the hill um, in 1984 at the Democratic Convention. And this was the idea that President Reagan offered that, um, you know, America such is, is really a, um, a shining city on, on the hill. It's a, it's a great country. And Governor Cuomo said in response, um, there's another part to the shining city. In this part of the city, there are more poor than ever, more families in trouble, more and more people who need help but can't find it. There are people who sleep in the city streets, in the gutter where the glitter doesn't show. And I think it would be a stretch to claim that Northampton, among all the communities in our region, suffers the most greatly. It hardly is the case. We have neighboring communities who are um, in much more difficult circumstances than we are. But I think you heard from some of the proponents of this project tonight that um, Northampton um, is not just that glitter. We're not just a nice downtown. 
We're not just the uh, commercial shops that you see when you drive up Pleasant Street or, or Main Street. Um, there are people who live in substandard housing in the city. Uh, there are people who cannot afford uh, the housing they do live in. And frankly, in Ward 3, there are people who live in tents in the meadows and are often the subject of derision rather than uh, the question, what can we do for these people? So I think that when we heard this comment at the last public meeting that somehow seeing this, this project is not an alluring thing for people to see when they drive up Pleasant Street. Um, and in fact, the term beacon was used. This is not, this project will not be a beacon for the city. Um, I, I couldn't disagree more because I think by appropriating this money, um, you know, we, we make ourselves a beacon for something we care very much about, which is affordable housing. And uh, far from wanting it on the outskirts of town, I, I'm happy it's downtown because people who live in affordable housing ought not to feel isolated. They ought to feel part of the community. And the two projects on Pleasant Street uh, do that, and they work together, and they work in concert with our larger plans for uh, Pleasant Street in general, which I believe will make uh, Northampton a, a, a greater city. Uh, so for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this is, I, I'd like to see this go forward. And I don't necessarily mind that um, it's not the most glamorous project um, that we're considering in the city. It's still vital. Just no. to, um, I just want to, if I could, provide a little more context for this. Um, I've been on the CPC for six years, and in that time, um, we have spent the lowest um, by percentage uh, amount on public housing, even though it's attracted the greatest leverage from state and federal um, agencies. Um, we've spent 16 percent, whereas we've spent 28 percent, 26 percent, and 28 percent on uh, open space, recreation, and historic preservation. So we on the CPC have reckoned, we keep on waiting for the affordable housing projects to come in. And what we've gotten is a trickle. Um, I'm gonna say that we have had approximately 30 units created of housing. These are the vast majority SRO single person. Um, I'm counting in the 30 units um, a house that was uh, rehabilitated for five people for the sober living project. Um, We've had six homes built by Habitat for Humanity. We have just had 43 assisted living, uh, affordable assisted living units that are going to go forward to Christopher Heights. Other than those six homes on Garfield Avenue, we have not funded any projects that house families. And again, just to point out, the HAP housing project is currently housing approximately 52 people in SRO units right now. When that project is completed, it will house 48. So that's a net loss of four on that street. So again, this is the only project that has come forward to the committee in my six years. So while I understand it's a significant project and it's important to give all considerations, and I think we did that. If you, if you looked at the minutes, if you watched the Northampton Community Television um, meeting, we were careful and I think we understood that this was a significant decision and that we could not possibly map out all the long-term effects. But at the same time, we recognize we've been waiting six years for a project of this significance to come forward. And if we miss this opportunity now, that we might not see it come around again for quite a while. Councilor Scherr. Um, I, I also was at the, the uh, December 29th meeting, and I was at um, other meetings about this. And I have been. Um, I have to say that I'm really impressed with how much Valley CDC has listened to uh, the concerns um, and has made pretty significant changes to this project along the way. Um, they have doubled, one of the main concerns that we were hearing was that there wasn't enough retail space. They literally doubled the retail space for this. Um, I, I think that um, they really have been working with the community and therefore they have heard what has been said. Um, I, I think this project, as Mr. Meyer was saying, is, is really vital. Um, I adore the HAP project. I'm thrilled about it. But it's not for families. Um, there's also this concern about parking. Uh, again, I'm very pleased about the HAP project. The HAP project has zero parking. This project has 0.75 spots per unit. So um, 
why this project's being criticized for something like that, but um, others aren't, is sort of beyond me. Uh, I, I think this project's incredibly important and I support it. Um, okay, um, I, I, I'll comment now. Um, so a few years ago, uh, this community was asked about whether, asked for a renewed vote whether it supported the CPA, the, the whole concept of the CPA. And it was actually from some sages predicted that it would go down in defeat. Consequently, it actually won with over between 70 and 75 percent of the vote in the community with a very large turnout in that election. It was a hotly contested election. So there was a lot of community input about the value of this and the particular emphasis was on, on affordable housing. And everyone admits and subscribes to the notion and idea of affordable housing. It's always in the application, of course, when it becomes the real bugaboo. Northampton actually is unique from a lot of city centers, in point of fact, because all our subsidized housing and affordable housing systems are on the periphery, away from services, divorced from contact uh, for services and amenities and proximity and visibility in the community. We just spent, in a, we spent two hours listening about the issues of disparity that are, that are present in this community. There, are, there is a distinct uh, separation that is a little awkward because we often brag in this community about our diversity. And it's kind of embarrassing because we don't really qualify, I think, in any legitimate sense. I will take at face value everyone's assertion and commitment to, to affordable housing and providing affordable housing. I will take that at face value. Now comes the more bold step where we have to decide where we put that. And I've heard over and over again, there's got to be a better place. That usually that level of resistance usually belies something else, and that worries me. But the fact is, is there is no better place. This is actually one of the most ideal locations. Period. It's proximate to every amenity. It's a offering a place of dignity, not some relegated ghettoization that isolates people, but that actually creates engagement and participation in the community. It's hard to avoid. You step out your door, you're in town, you are part of the city. You're part of the vitality and the vibrancy that contributes to the community. And I, for one, would like the opportunity not to be embarrassed when I talk about diversity in this community and not being able to, to say that we actually embrace it. The issues that I've heard relative to the objection the objections have been structural, design-wise, mass, uh, scale. Now, the issues of scale are particularly challenging because given the proximate abutters, you can't accommodate the scale. It's against our zoning. <clears throat> we have a minimum requirement of 30 feet in height. <clears throat> it is actually, this proposal is more in concert with the aggregate structures. If you look at the aggregate structures on Pleasant Street transitioning into the downtown, it is more in conformance with that than some of the other structures that actually now stand as pre-existing non-conforming uses under the law. I understand and I, and I actually sympathize, although I doubt they'll believe me, but I, the, uh, the abutters concerns relative to the dimensions and size and scope. But I think it's, a, I, I think it's an unwarranted dread. But that I, I can't prove that to them one way or the other. I can, you don't argue with feelings. But the fact is, is that mass size, uh, uh, Councillor Adams reminded me this is very similar to the discussions and pushback that we heard with the development of Hamden Court. Uh, Hamden Court is equivalent in mass. Provide no parking. There is no playground for children. There is not really housing for families. There's a concrete courtyard with a fountain, but there's retail on the ground floor, but you actually don't see the retail for the most part out on the city front. This meets every accommodation that we've actually built predicated on the zoning that was designed based on the Vision 2020 plan, uh, the gateway program, the idea to actually create a sense of continuity and structures that will come in time. They're not going to come all at once, but they're going to come in time. 
this structure, by the way, the, the discussion I've heard it sounds, you know, is being described as some kind of hideous thing. It's actually not. And in fact, actually, I, I think the drawings that I've seen and that we've experienced, I think, are actually personally, I think, aesthetically quite arresting and distinctive and, and actually would contribute to the value of what I think. But we can't argue with aesthetics either, ultimately. So I, I actually supported this from the start. So I outed myself pretty early about where my support was for this. I actually wrote a letter of endorsement for the CDC because of the CDC's record. The CDC has met resistance throughout the community. I think some of you might recall uh, Mr. Krasinski's issues that they had in East Hampton when they proposed a project there. The Valley CDC has served this community enormously well, and in, in particularly in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, Downey's correct. Their reputation statewide is actually unmatched, and consequently they are honored with, by state federal authorities for their work. I really, th I can't emphasize enough that I think given the context of the conversation that made us even more aware of our issues here in this community that we had tonight, that it's very, it's critical that we proceed forward with this. This is our community's investment of $300,000 in a multi-million dollar project. And the thing is, is that if we don't succeed in passing this, then all the rest of the process, by which, by the way, public process continues because this is the, the uh, opportunity to affect and change this project continues in public, and, and the public can continue to make contributions. If we stagnate it tonight or the, in, in February 5th, then we've successfully, I, I think you, we, we've, we've uh, we've obviated our obligation under the CDC. What the community has demanded that we do, we, this is the one thing that the CDC is its clearest mission. And if we don't, if we don't approve this, we have t we have talked the talk and not walked the walk, and would be to our eternal shame. It would be I would be mortified and ashamed if we couldn't actually get this tiny hurdle. And it's not a big one. This is a tiny hurdle. You can argue about other CDC projects. We actually, we just passed a whole slew of them. We're going to go up to a bunch in second reading. Without a, so much as a buy your leave, there wasn't any pushback, there was nothing. It's not that this project is so unique that it, it actually reaches the threshold of contempt. It's interesting, the resistance to this. But I, for one, I think you can plainly see, I will vote yes as loud as I can. Any other discussion? As you are made aware that, um, and actually, Councilor, I don't know if I heard from you, was uh, your interest is to have, uh, Councilor Barge, is to have two, is to have not two readings tonight, but to have one reading tonight and then the next. Right. I was going to ask you, Councilor, because we do one reading tonight and then on February 5th would be the second. Correct. Okay. My issue was having that first week reading tonight. Do we have a problem here with the voting tonight? That's a big concern with me. Can this actually be tabled tonight and on February 5th do two readings? Councilman. Can that be said done? That, we said that last time. That's what brought us here. The person who suggested that is not here. The person who. Trust so, me. <laughs> uh, you, you may not wish to defer to the counselor that made the request, or have, have you had the conversation? No. Did that counselor request being present? No. I have, I have not. So I don't, I don't know. Uh, Council Murphy uh, is recused from the discussion and from the, from the vote. So he, he, Councilor Spector, on the other hand, asked for the deferment. Uh, I had fully expected that he would be here tonight because we did change the schedule to accommodate him, but uh, apparently he's not. So the fact remains is that essentially structurally, if let me just lay this out, if the vote does not survive tonight, it's dead. There does there is not a second reading. It's done. It's dead. Period. So can it be tabled and have the two readings on February? 5th? That is a possibility. Yes, and if if you want to make the motion to table it, I would like to make a motion to table it and do two readings on February fifth. Is there a second to that motion? 
Second, clarify that we're, it's a motion to postpone to the next meeting. Correct. It, can we have discussion around questions? Unfortunately, on the table, you cannot. There okay. cannot be a discussion. I just would like to understand what the postponement I think will. I think that's reasonable but oh you want to understand what it would mean it would mean what, that what it will give us in terms of moving this vote forward yeah unfortunately no that would be the uh, um, deliberation yeah okay um, so uh, roll call on that please are we doing a roll call on, on the ta to table um, council with barges motion to table with two readings on February 5th there was a uh, council of Donald seconded. Okay, Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. No. Councilor Klein. No. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murph. Sorry, Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. No. We have one, two, three, Hi. four yeses, three noes. The motion carries. It's tabled until uh, the next meeting. Councilor? Yes, I, I just also wanted to talk, and I want to thank the counselors for supporting that, which, with the phone calls I've gotten and the emails, I am hoping that the abutters and whoever feel that they should have that opportunity to speak to come here and if they don't then that's their problem I'm sorry, bear with me. We're having the quorum voting issue, which in order to make a tabling motion pass. Um, in the absence of a statutory requirement providing otherwise, an affirmative vote in the majority of a quorum shall pass any other measure. So that's what we just did. Yeah, we that just did that. It's a, simple, a simple, it's simple majority. Right? It's a simple majority is 4-3. Right. So I think that, yeah. An affirmative vote of the majority of a quorum. So that that is, that is am I reading? Yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple majority vote. So it stands. It's it's uh, tabled until then. Okay. And it's Ca uh, Council O'Donnell. You have a question. It's, point of order. it's not tabling, right? It's just postponing. <laughs> it's postponing, postponing it. I'm sorry, <coughs> I've mischaracterized it, but so. Okay. So uh, next up. <laughs> Do you guys want to move up closer? Are you fine there? Or you just warm the seats and up? Hey, we're moving up in the financial orders. The, uh, uh, the, 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 no, it's not. This is under orders and ordinances. I'm sorry. And this is item, um, ba -ba -bum. C, under number 11. Okay. Uh, this is the ordinances regarding salaries and benefits for elected officials and I'd ask before we start um, that we recognize the entire advisory committee in <coughs> so that you would all have the opportunity to speak if, if you so desire um, so moved okay second all those in favor please say aye aye no. <coughs> um, and before we start, are there comments from the councilors? Uh, I mean, I, actually, you know, I, I just want to preface this. I, I think it's appropriate to, to preface it because actually this has made some headlines, obviously, and there has been, it's, it's important to address the elephant in the room, I think, in some level, because there's some, there, I think some feelings were uh, hurt, and I don't mean to diminish it by that. There, there were some, uh, some, essentially a debate via the newspaper, which perhaps is not the best forum to do it, but in fact, deference to Mr. DeRose, I think that having a newspaper is, is, a, is a gift to a community. And in fact, the reason this room has been packed all night and we're having this long deliberation is because every <coughs> issue was relatively, it was, was addressed in the Gazette. So that, that said, that I would like 
actually everyone to understand that the, the purpose of this discussion is to try and find the most best, fair, efficacious way in order to determine the value of elected officials who do, who are described as part-time, but actually that's not the definition in any charter or mass general law that I, I know because actually the, uh, the times of elect, uh, elected officials are not assigned how much time they should work. Um, the mayor, if he were so inclined, could just phone it in. He wouldn't survive the next election, but the fact is he's not required to work 40, 50, 60 hours, which, which it should, it should go on record that he does do. The same is true of the city clerk, and actually the same is true of the council. So the description of part-time is a little, little skewed. But the, the, the principal objective, I think, of everyone talking is to come to that point. Now, for the public's perspective, I have to explain, this is a bit of a poison pill. There is a built-in conflict of interest because the fact that the council or the legislative body is obliged to vote on all financial orders and transactions, that's essentially the public's opportunity to at least have some representation uh, in any discussion about financial orders. And that works beautifully right up to this one tipping point because this is one financial order where we're obliged to vote in our own interests. And it, uh, obviously, it's been suggested in the Gazette and other, where, other places that we're voting our own interest at our own detriment. And I think that's essentially what's happened. This is, this is, this is the equivalent of taking a bath with a plugged-in toaster for a politician, actually, to, to, to vote on their salary and stipend. It's also why we haven't ever in my history, I've been on the council, I was elected the same year Council of the Barge was. It has never come up. We don't vote on it because who wants to touch that? Uh, this was compelled actually uh, through charter reform. The idea for establishing a, an advisory committee was essentially to provide political cover, uh, which is, I, I'm grateful for. And in fact, actually, unfortunately, the poor group that was uh, signed on to do this as volunteers ended up getting political stuff all over them that they didn't sign up for, I'm pretty sure. That's, that's actually part of our job description, and we've got to suck up all the stuff that gets splattered when fans get hit. So that said, I think what I would like, and I hope, that our conversation can start anew so we can understand the interest. I mean, what came up in the debate last time, because uh, none of the members were here principally because they weren't invited. We did not actually ask them. It's not that they were disinvited. In fact, actually, I think there was somewhat of a presumption that, and, an, and an unfair presumption that they might, would show at, at the hearing. That being the case, in fact, there were a number of questions that came up in the course of the debate and the discussion that needed clarification. Uh, there have been some subsequent emails, but that's not a public deliberation, and, uh, and, and I should point out it has not violated mass open meeting law because everyone was very assiduous about that. But I think now is an opportunity for us to open up that conversation, figure out how we proceed, or should we proceed, and um, and do our level best to do what we actually signed on for. That said, um, I'm not sure, Todd, if you want to speak, you want to come up as the chair at this point to just, or, and, and by the way, I'm not assigning it. If any, if any other members would prefer to come up and speak or if they're interested well, in. We have nothing to say. We understand you guys have questions. So if you want to pose the question, we'd be happy to address that. The, the problem is we need you at the podium just for, okay. so, so that's all. And I don't care who comes to the podium. It's just. Okay. Okay. So who would like to start? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We've got to put this on the floor. Yeah, got to kind of introduce. Did you need to recognize the committee? First, let's put this on the floor, then we'll recognize, and we did yes. recognize the committee prematurely, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it again. And since they're the only people left in the room, practically, and since our not. <laughs> um, but I'll accept the motion, put this on the floor. I'll move to Second. 14.304. Okay. 14.304, uh, that's benefit. So, um, but for the purposes of the discussion, I'd probably be expect, okay. Is there a second on that? I second it. Council of the Barge, and we have recognized Todd. All right, who would like to 
Uh, there were some questions. Does anyone want to follow up on those questions now? Council Reynolds. Mr. Thompson, um, if this council did again what it did on first reading and voted against the recommendation to remove um, the health insurance option, um, I'll ask you, but also the other committee members, what, what do you think would be um, a fair amount to reduce the stipend to? I'm assuming, well, we, we know that. Hey, can, you, can you start over? You're sure. Saying is the, my understanding is the council is voting to affirm what's already in the charter. So if you vote no on this mo motion, this ordinance, basically we're back to the charter where you have health benefits. So it's kind of a win-win for you guys. You vote yes, you get to keep health benefits. You vote no, you get to keep health benefits. So I'm a little bit confused by the process, the way the ordinance was framed. It's actually the wording specifically is basically a, a re telling of what's in the current charter benefits and expenses the mayor city clerk city council school committee and trustees of smith vocational and agricultural high school shall be eligible to enroll in the city's municipal health insurance program that's almost identical mm -hmm. to the current charter what's left out here what's amended is you took out retirement be benefits which we understand now is a state issue so i'm not quite sure you're not voting on what we proposed you're voting on what's that's that's it's it's that's a, a fair and good point. Well, so, so here here's my question. I, I don't I don't. That that ordinance came on recommendation of the mayor, and the ordinance as written maintains the benefits. Okay. Can I just ask a question? This is open. We recommended to discontinue this process. How did the mayor get involved well, in flipping what we rec recommended? Was there a subcommittee process, and how how did that play out? Because we're a bit clueless. Th this came. On the recommendation from the mayor, in the mayor's office, um, you know that's that's how it came to us. To recognize the mayor, the mayor doesn't need to be recognized. The okay. mayor is automatically recognized. So if the mayor, if the mayor, wants the mayor. okay, because it's just confusing for us when we presented this report to you. You guys got it end of October. We came November six, gave our presentation. There were no questions. Our understanding, and I don't know. I think this was discussed at that meeting. Is this would be kicked to subcommittee and kind of work its way through the progress. And uh, Councillor Carney even asked if we would be available to answer questions when it was in subcommittee, and we said sure. But so I'm a bit confused. Now it seems like it made it to the mayor, and I thought there was a separation of powers. I thought this was something you guys were handling. So I, I'm confused how the mayor got involved in this. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead. the mayor can sponsor ordinances. The mayor sponsored this ordinance. Other than that, it's not sure what the confusion is. Okay, so the mayor sponsored an ordinance that basically went against the recommendations that we had made before there was any hearing about those recommendations. Is that what took place? And then you guys did it go through subcommittee, and did you there, did you talk there, about our really report? a hearing before an ordinance is submitted? They're typically submitted, and then they go through the committee process, and that's when the, the discussions are had. So so yes, the mayor submitted the ordinance to the council. Put on the agenda for our consideration. Okay. That ordinance maintained the old system, the old system of um, allowing for the option of the health insurance benefits to those particular elected officials. Okay. Well, I'm still confused because I, I would have thought logically, if we make a proposal, there's going to be an ordinance sort of based on our proposal. Well, the, you guys can ignore it. You can vote it down. Well, the committee. Well, we only got a set of. The, the committee was free to do that. Mm -hmm. We got a set of recommendations. Any of those could have been put in ordinance form and submit it to us we just got the recommendations itself so the mayor decided to present that ordinance in that form okay okay <laughs> go ahead i'm sorry this is your question following that i just was asking for some clarification on the process i'll, I'll, I'll withdraw it okay um and actually and when i want to uh, i don't know if it's been successful either what i want to avoid is a debate because you're actually you're not the deliberative body at this point so the I think, no, no, I, think that, it's, I think it's completely appropriate for you to ask questions no and that's and I, I was promised yeah. by Councillor Adams when we had an email exchange that this was going to be a fair and open discussion and we had some questions which I, I think were fair so I just wanted to absolutely to pose that no, so. no, no absolutely right I, I just I wanted to frame that also for the councilors so everyone understands that the purpose of this is uh, exploratory okay and sure thank you other questions? Councilor Shara. Um, 
Thank you very much for sure. being here so late this evening. So one thing I would like some clarification on is um, under the health insurance benefits section, um, you say that the, one of the main concerns is equity and fairness. And, um, and so you say the recommendation to discontinue eligibility for health insurance benefits, um, that was the recommendation. So the board thought it appropriate to increase stipends to compensate members for the loss of these benefits. Um, so I just have a couple questions on that. So for some, if not all, that are, would be losing the benefit, um, it would end up being a net loss in their compensation? Um, two, two points. When we looked at this issue, as thorny as it is, and I'm sure if you've, there, there are a couple of different ways. We, we had more questions than we had answers. Um, we were trying to figure out the best solution for the city and the council moving forward. We didn't really pay attention to counselor A or B. We didn't know which counselors were receiving family plans. We were told by the, the HR department just the numbers, not the names. And so we focused moving forward on what we thought was best for the city. And indeed, a school committee member who was receiving family health benefits valued at $11,600 would suffer a net loss. But in our mind, that, that wasn't our concern. We, we weren't charged to look at what was in the best interest of each individual counselor. We were charged to look at what was equitable and appropriate for the city. Um, that doesn't mean we didn't talk about it, because we did. It certainly came up in conversation. But if you, if you start with the premise that, okay, someone's going to lose a $11,600 benefit, and let's assume they're entitled to it, okay? So we have to pay them back. We would then have to increase stipends for school committee members to over $14,000. For counselors, it's $11,000. 0.6 plus 5,000, so almost $17,000. We didn't feel that that was viable. We felt that was, that was excessive. And indeed, in talking to Councillor Spector, and Councillor Dwight has confirmed this, he, he made that proposal to the, counselor, to, to the council. And my understanding, based on what Paul and Bill has said, is that that's, that was a non-starter. When you talk about salaries of 14,000, 17,000, that was a non-starter. So it's, I think it's, it's fair to talk about um, you know, that, that sort of loss to an individual counselor, but you guys apparently had an opportunity to address that and you decided not to. So there's an inconsistency there that I'll push back against. But yeah, we, okay. we basically put the city in front of individual counselors because the alternative was not viable. Well, and, and I appreciate that, ex you know. except that I mean, you state that you were increasing stipends to compensate for that loss, so that As actually a, sounds like... Okay, what, what we were doing, and this was explicit, if you go back in our minutes, and, and I think our meetings are videotaped on file at the North Street website, um, we talked about compensating um, uh, elected officials, part-time elected officials, as a class. And so that's where you, we try to approach parity between the current cost of the city being $76,000 and the increase in stipends is around $68,000. So we, we, we were cognizant of trying to compensate you guys as a whole class of elected officials mm -hmm. um, in order not to strain the budget of the city. So again, as a class, I think we, were, we, were, we made an effort to do that, but we really, yeah, to, to address each individual loss would, would have meant an increase in stipends that just was not realistic. Council Luar. Yes. I know, Todd, when I had talked with you um, in regards of a meeting that you were possibly trying to get set up in August, no. and I could not do that because it was a bad time, counselors are on vacation and so forth. But I really enjoyed talking with you on the phone, and there was a meeting that was at the, a Thursday, which City Council also at their meeting so I submitted a letter into you mm -hmm. I don't have the city insurance I know nothing about who had it or who had it on school mm -hmm. committee my main concern was what I did as a city councilor 
not knowing really about the benefits on it, but because once you finished off what you did and all of your volunteers and brought that to our city council, before our city council, so which gave us time to look at it, I had talked, this is, I'm talking about city employees who have called me upset that working under the 20 hours a week, which I know has nothing to do with this, felt they couldn't believe that elected officials were getting benefits. Not, they didn't care about that salary. It was the benefits. Then I heard from, which I talked with our council president, and just on his salary alone, of what it is costing him, which he's hardly coming out with anything. I, I, I really feel that the, the benefit is very, very valuable. And looking at the research that has been going on since December, and I've been doing some research, and even Councilor Jesse Adams, I mean, he brought up about the amount of cities that you looked at. Very interesting tonight with our former council president, James Dostal, bringing in to ours, us councilors, of a recommendation, okay? And I, I just want to say that I thank you for talking with me on the phone. I want to thank the committee for working very tirelessly. Like you told me, you were having difficulties trying to get your committee together because you also had a time limit. And I know what it's like when you have to work on a time limit. But I want you to uh, ex I want to explain to you, Todd, that is why I changed my mind because of the research after the information came in and getting phone calls and talking with, with people about this. Because I don't, it's not my business to go ask counselor who's got insurance or school committee or anything like that. You didn't know either you said that. Yeah. Uh, Councilor So the, the committee relied very much on what other communities are doing, of course. Um, uh, that, was, that was our starting point. When, when this whole can process... Can I just speak okay. right, please? All right. So the, the, com the committees relied to a good extent for their recommendations on what other communities were doing uh, throughout the report. They Is that a help. question or a statement? I'll, I'll get to the okay. question. Okay. Right. Speak for a so... Again, the committee relied heavily on what other communities were doing uh, in the report th to make their recommendations. They were benchmarking. Um, so how does the committee reconcile when it comes to health insurance that when you're looking at the eight surrounding uh, cities benchmark, seven out of eight similar communities in Western Massachusetts um, offer, the, offer the health insurance benefit, and when you look at the surrounding 23 cities benchmark, 17 out of 23 for a total of 74% allow it. I know aside from that, um, you sent me a Boston Globe art article, which I noted um, stated that there's a trend towards um, removing health insurance benefits. Um, but I also noticed two things. Um, one, they're almost all towns with completely different forms of government and totally dissimilar and not otherwise mentioned in this report. And two, the cities mentioned in that Boston Globe article all gave health insurance benefits. So I'm wondering how for the benchmarking that this committee did, um, you know, you can find a study that says otherwise, but for the benchmarking that this committee did, how does it reconcile the fact that the eight surrounding uh, cities benchmark, seven out of eight give health insurance benefits, and the 23 surrounding cities benchmark, 17 out of 23 for a total of 74 percent? Well, I'm going to let um, Dennis come up here and talk about benchmarking, but two comments first. Um, Dennis is the HR director in Greenfield, knows this stuff backwards and forwards, so I think he can answer your specific questions. Two comments first. Benchmarking is where we started. It's an imperfect tool. It was helpful in looking at salaries, but when we addressed health insurance, three concerns came up. One was equity. To get to Councilor LaBarge's question, why should a part-time librarian not be eligible for health insurance and city councilors be eligible? We found that um, a bit unsettling and of great concern. The second issue was one of equity. Some 
school committee members make $2,500. Some counselors make $5,000 in stipend, but they're earning multiples of that in their health insurance. We felt that equity issue was, a, was important to address. The third issue, as Councillor Dwight addressed, is the whole conflict of issue of you guys voting on this every go round. Those through three issues in our mind trumped the benchmarking issue. We did look at benchmarking. We included that data. The reason you have that data is we included it in our report, but it was not sufficient to overcome our three other concerns. Second point I'd like to make, this country has, you're arguing that somehow there's an established practice that we ignored. I think that was the, the term that you used. We ignored established practice. This country's history is one of overcoming established practice. You, we heard it today in this discussion, be it the monarchy, slavery, institutional racism, established practices are simply that. We move on, we try to improve. We looked at this established practice and we thought we found problems with it. That's why we, we recommended discontinuing the practice while almost doubling salaries. We double the school committee salary, we double the trustees of Smith Volk, and we almost double yours. We didn't double it completely because we didn't have a consensus to do that. But that was our thinking, is to compensate for that loss. We recognize it as a loss, but we thought it was in the best interest for the city and for the council moving forward if we did that. So at this point, Dennis, do you want to come and address? Uh, um, the, the one, one of the questions I had actually was, yeah. um, it was first represented, of course, that uh, using the benchmarking for the for the stipends mm -hmm. uh, was an adjustment in inflationary dollars because actually there was a time and determinant as to when this was origi originated. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, it's also offered as an offset for the loss of the uh, proposed loss of of the benefits. So, which is it? It can't be both. It's got to be uh, one or the other. It's, it's both and all together, and it's, it's what our consensus was. Um, I, I, I think we, we, we thought about inflation. That was a consideration. We thought about compensation. They were both considerations. Okay. Um, and you guys are free to ignore that as well. Oh, no, it's, it's fine. Uh, Councilor Klein. And Dennis, you're, you're, still, you're still invited to come up. Uh, Councilor Klein. So I know the term that we use to have this discussion is compensation, but I want to think about it in terms of what that means. So I'm kind of curious about the process that the committee went through. First of all, I want to say thank you, because I know you put a lot of time into this, and I'm sorry that I didn't say that right at the get-go. <coughs> but um, was there a process of actually talking to elected officials I didn't hear from the committee. I kind of was excited when it was established. I didn't. You were invited. We sent out an invitation to the mayor. We sent out an invitation to the council. We actually had to send it out again because no one responded. We heard from Paul Spector. We heard from um, Councillor Labarge. Um, and so we sent out invitations. We've been over backwards. We were getting pressure to get this thing in. I, we didn't understand the deadline, but we were, we were working under a deadline. And unfortunately, we did this sort of in, in August into September. But we sent out invitations. I mean, we, we made a huge effort to in, involve stakeholders. We heard from all um, all three trustees at Smith Vote, I think. Was it all three? Two. Two out of three. Um, we heard from from two school committee members. One and an, one other wrote in. So we, we made a, a big effort to do that. And, and I, I'm curious just to understand a little bit more about that process, though. I mean, what... Did you ask people about? I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not. I'm not yeah. trying to skewer you here. I really yeah. just want more information about how. Well, did, did did you actually read the report? Because we talk about how we we invited elected officials. We wanted to find out the time commitments, the work descriptions. That's where we came up with the part time. You know, 12 to 15 hours. We ask about how many how many hours a week you spend in subcommittees and committees and council hearings. We asked all of those questions, and we spent with Ali Meyer, who was here. He he spent two hours talking with us about the roles and responsibilities of school community member, extremely helpful. Um, so no, I think we, we certainly made an effort. Um, we didn't get a huge response, but that's the way it goes. And then how was, um, if for no other reason, kind of public record on mm -hmm. camera, can you talk a little bit about how you figured out from these interviews or the information you collected from the folks that did respond, 
um, how you figured out what appropriate compensation was for the amount of hours people put in, the other kinds of things that Jim Dostal talked about today in terms of you know travel, not being compensated for um, time, talking to constituents, things like that. I'm yeah, just, I'm we wondering. tried, um, because of the delicacy that Councillor Dwight referred to, we made a real effort in our report to be comprehensive and sort of self-explanatory. Because when this first came out, people were accusing us of being stooges of the council. And we wanted to set to establish our process, show that we were transparent, we were independent, professional volunteers, um, working for the best interest of the city. And, and so we wrote what we thought, and we worked really hard in the drafts to make a self-explanatory comprehensive report. I would encourage you to read the report. There's not much, not much else that we can say um, uh, about the process. I think it was fair, it was transparent, um, and it was, we tried, we really worked hard toward a consensus. Um, I just I yeah. want to reiterate I wasn't asking okay. these questions because I'm you know coming at you with complaints yeah. blaming you I just yeah. think that this is a discussion that we need to have um, for the public as well sure. so that's that's really what I was trying to okay. get okay no I mean I again I'd encourage people I don't think many people have actually read the report I've gotten some emails from people in the public read the report it's on the um, it's on various websites um, uh, and certainly read it. We tried to be self-explanatory and comprehensive. And I, I really, going into process, I, I don't want to sort of miss, this was again five, six months ago. My memory is not that clear. Um, we debated back and forth. It's reflected in the minutes. Um, and then in terms of other criteria, um, Councillor O'Donnell at the last meeting talked about um, the health insurance piece being a policy decision you know do we value making health insurance available to employ uh, to elected officials in this city but I think that there's some value of thinking about um, salary and compensation in other ways as well as a policy decision you know what is it what what is um, raising salary actually change motivate it motivates people to come forward that might not be able to run for the council for a council position so I just think that we as a council need to be thinking kind of broadly about what we're accomplishing by keeping salaries at a particular level or raising them because it has I think deeper implications um, I work full, at a full-time job to support myself and my family and I put in over 20 hours a week to my council duties so I'm working more than 60 hours a week um, there are a lot of people that can't do it for different reasons. I don't. I happen to not have children. Some people that have children that might be interested are not going to be able to run. So I'm just I'm thinking about how do we actually make this um, kind of going back to the discussion we had about using CPA funds for affordable housing. How do we make this council reflective of this community? How do we encourage people who don't have the luxury of not working a full time job to run for a council seat? So. Those are the kinds of things that I hope all of us can think about. And again, I'm not skewering the committee. I'm just bringing into this discussion other ways to think about what, um, what compensation means. It's more about kind of a policy decision, a commitment to making this council into a representative body. Well, yeah, that, that's a bit beyond the charge that we were given to sort of um, uh, to look at the adequacy and the appropriateness of compensation. And so, yeah, I we just, weren't. I'm seeing this as a discussion, and again, like no, I, said, I know, and I, I so that the council is also are questions. Considered. Those are some of the same questions that we ask, and you know, the, the issue of whether you know um, uh, if we, if we double stipends, whether that will attract people. If we, I, mean, I was on the charter drafting committee, and Steve Harrell stood here and suggested that counselors get paid sixty thousand dollars. How much? Uh, sixty thousand dollars, and he had a he had a coherent argument that I respected. Um, there's a political re reality that we sort of live in. We tried to craft our recommendations to fit within that reality. You guys define the reality. This council has not been willing to vote on this in the past twenty five years we felt a little bit constrained by that reluctance and in talking with counselors we threw out different numbers and you know as Councillor Dwight has said when you get above fifteen thousand dollars that's really hard for this council to swallow but that's for you to decide you need to set the tone for the next advisory board 
um, to perhaps be more expansive, be more daring, if that's what you feel they should do. Um, but we were sort of living within certain constraints um, of our charge. Um, so, Tom, Tom. Tom. Thank you. <coughs> and thanks, I'll offer my thanks too for coming uh, in the lion's den here. But I think as Lisa Klein, uh, Councilor Klein points out, um, it's not. It's. It shouldn't be an adversarial thing at all. And so, on the subject wait, of wait, tone, wait, can I just address no, 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 that? Yeah, you, wait, if you let me finish, okay. Todd, you, you, the, the subject. Okay. The subject of tone is is actually what I want to address because I have great respect for the work you've done. And, but this is a this is a, a comment, and I'll ask my question, which is not substantive, but it has to do with today. Um, I don't have much patience for interrupting each other in this public forum or pointedly asking my colleagues whether they have read the report. I think that we can assume that everyone has taken the information in and, and given the work that you have done, um, the scrutiny it deserves. The question that I would like to ask you is, I actually think Councilor Klein's point about whether the salaries that we have as a city um, give us the kind of council and government we want is actually a good question. And you write, in, in, in a rationale uh, for full-time elected official, officials that the board felt strongly that the mayor's salary should be competitive with those in the private sector. My question is, um, did you make the, did you, did you apply the same question to the council? Um, do you think that your recommendations uh, will create a more competitive environment politically for the council? We, I'll, I'll speak for a, the board, I, I think we tried to craft an equitable, fair, um, appropriate compensation package um, that observes best practices as they increasingly are being um, considered. So yes, we did. Okay. Um, okay, thank and you. as for tone, just to address this elephant in the room, I got defensive in the press when I got a phone call um, after, I guess, your, your last vote, um, hearing that accusations that our report was flawed. And I pushed back against that. I don't think our report was flawed. Our report was what it was. You guys have always been free to ignore or reject what we recommend. And so I pushed back against that notion of shooting the messenger, basically. And then Councillor Ciara wrote an op-ed saying that we were unavailable, unresponsive, I don't know where that narrative came from, but I took that as an attempt to shoot the messenger, which to me felt in my deepest bones as sort of an abuse of power on the, count, on the part of the council. And that's why I responded the way I did. Because I, we, again, volunteers acting in good faith, we have no ax to grind, no vested interest, no conflict of interest. And to be accused of being unresponsive really offended me. And that's, I, I apologize for the remarks that I made, but that's why my tone is a little bit heated, because I feel like you guys are shooting us as the messenger. It, and, well, and you guys are free to disagree, actually, but I, don't shoot the messenger. I'd like to address that, actually. Um, point of fact, I don't know who reported to you that, you, that uh, this council said that report was flawed. Uh, Councilor Spector and Councilor Adams did. Well, it, it wasn't an issue of flawed. It was the fact that we did not have confidence in the report because we didn't understand the report. And to be perfectly honest, I still don't. But that, that's what we're working on. I'm struggling. I appreciate the time and energy that people are investing to help me understand that. So to that point, I, and actually I know poor Dennis has been standing here waiting to talk about it. Oh, that's good because my legs are working out. Okay. <laughs> that's true, you're probably running a risk of an aneurysm with like an airplane or something. But, um, leading up to that, I, I think, you know, I, from what I understand, what I'm hearing you say is the, the principal objective for city money and, and to provide equity and parity. Uh, no, and, and no, no, those were not, the, okay, we no, never, we never, I don't think we ever mentioned saving the city money. I don't think that's ever, that was ever listed. My bad, so. my bad. Um, I think to Councilor Klein's point, I think it's kind of important, actually. Um, and I know it wasn't your charge. In fact, it's interesting because we didn't draft your charge. Your, tra your charge was drafted in charter, which you participated in drafting. So, <laughs> so the fact is we didn't draft your charge. 
you actually, uh, the mayor swore you guys in for two years. It doesn't mean that you're indentured servants for two years, but the fact that you did deliver your, your committee report in prompt order. But the fact is, what I'd like to do is somehow actually maybe redirect the focus. Not necessarily, because actually I'm going to own something first. Um, I believe actually that health insurance is a moral obligation from for any institution and agency to provide particularly given and and speaking of trends that tends to be the trend until we come up with some better health care uh, provision for the time being that is the best function within a dysfunction where institutions entities employers people who use the services of people provide health care coverage so it's not based on merit it's not based on it, for the most part on ours, except for the GIS, of course, is the one that set the standard for uh, health insurance uh, for employees who work 20 hours, under 20 hours. Employees, and in school cases, under 17 hours. The city has uh, actually a rather large inventory of employees who work part-time who do qualify for health insurance, and I think that is correct. What I don't think is correct is the ones who, other ones who do work at this kind of, by my reckoning, an arbitrary cutoff, but clearly some wise insurance companies amortized this out and figured out that that's the cutoff point. But I do, I do actually, I hold that, and I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not where you guys started from this, you and I sharing the same principles on that. I, I got the sense that you guys, you have a lot of HR people on your, on your committee, and I understand why that would not be uh, a primary motivation as, as far as discussion. The, but, that said, to Councillor Klein's point, we, we are not a representative body. We are, in name, a representative body of the city of Northampton, but we do not represent the population spread by wealth, class, or, or anything else. I mean, we, we, uh, we actually are people, by and large, who are actually able to devote this time without committing seppuku. And we are um, financially able to sustain ourselves, given the $5,000 stipend. Um, and not to bring it on me, but I've already been outed that I actually I have the health care coverage. And uh, I'm currently unemployed. My wife's an adjunct professor at Hoyer Community College. And you know, there's one institution that does not acknowledge my, my faith, that you were supposed to provide health insurance for people who work for you. So we would not have coverage, and consequently, it would come. It would come in a significant burden, one that I couldn't actually abide. I couldn't run in good conscience. Not, but that's. Where it's, I'm not making the rules based on me. But the fact is, if I'm eliminated from the consideration for running for council, that means there's a huge raft of people in the city of Northampton who are also never considered. We are never likely to see a single mother with a couple kids considering running for the city council. Although. That's a pretty large representative portion of the population that is unheard from. I mean, we, we're, we're not deaf to it, but the fact is, it's, it's, the concern is, is that to promote, I, I mean, my hope is that as we look forward and investigate what it means to serve on a council and how we can have a good and strong and viable council, what's the best way to entice the broadest spectrum of, of candidates in, the, in, the, in an election? That's clearly beyond what you were charged with. I, absolutely. You're not supposed to correct all the, the wrongs. But the fact is, is that I thought if that were kind of the touchstone, that maybe if we start to address this and using that as a starting point for the conversation about um, generating uh, a compensation package that not only addresses issues of e uh, equity and parity. I mean, the parity issue is uh, you were working on in the stipends, but then you you conflated that with the with the insurance issue, and then you added to that the conflict of interest issue, which is absolutely unavoidable. I I honestly wish it would it could be unavoid it could be avoided, but the fact is that would mean we would have to cede representative authority over over uh, a, a fiduciary decision. I would argue, actually, if, if it wasn't up to the council, the, the council's salaries would be much higher and, and compensation packages would, of course, exist. Mm -hmm. But so what I'm hoping is that, that 
I, I mean, I've been tossing around this idea in the weeks, in the subsequent weeks since uh, the last meeting, which was last year, and thinking about the possibility of actually having a step back, and I'm not even making a motion yet, but having a step back and revisit this and, and actually bear our responsibility by participating with the conversations with the committee that was shortcoming and, didn't, and wasn't realized when you had it. Um, and consider th and make that one of, the, one of the focal points, one of the driving points. And, I, and, and, and a wise man once said to me that, uh, that to do what other cities do isn't, isn't, is, is an ethically dubious argument. And I agree. And I think we should break the mold. I think we can redefine how uh, elected officials, particularly as you describe them part-time, which I take issue with, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, but how elected officials can be compensated and generate decent representation within the community. And essentially what I'm, I'm asking if you would be amenable, I'm not even proposing it as a motion yet, if you'd be amenable to reconvening uh, with, with, with considerable more input from us, not I, 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 you, but I mean, would you be amenable to discussing it, focusing on that aspect? I, I think there's a lot of, um, I think we, the city would be better served with a new committee. Um, we made our recommendations. We spent six months, uh, again, Dennis is going to come and talk about benchmarking mm -hmm. a bit, but we spent a long time thinking this through. We did the best job we could, um, and we put it down for you. If it's, if it's unclear, then that's, all, then, then that's our failure. Um, but I really don't see us getting back, this group getting back together. Um, well, would you mind if I actually jump Sure, over? sure, yeah, I'll let yeah. everyone else. Is, is that the consensus of the, of the other members? I really don't you? like these people, so I just <laughs> <laughs> I understand. We will, we will no, no force, no force does. Anyone else? Would anyone else be interested or that you've had your fill? No. Got it, okay. All right, uh, Councilor Carney. Sure. Yeah, yeah, please, please. And you have to do it at the podium, if you will. So. Um, I wear my glasses. I just, I just need to point out, I totally agree with what you're saying about everybody deserving health insurance. And as an HR person, I take personally a little offense to your comment to assume that we wouldn't want people to have benefits. Okay, Is that sorry. what I was hearing? Fair. Yeah. Fair. Um, but that said, to me, that brings up the equity issue, which is that what about other part-time employees of the city? So if you're really committed to believing that everyone has health insurance, it shouldn't just be for the city council. It should be for every employee of no, the city. And, and in fact, actually, no argument there. All right. So the I just need to say that. that as, uh, but in just a second, yeah. And you can have that in a second. But it, it, the division, of course, of powers, that doesn't mm -hmm. come under us. And in fact, actually, the problem with this uh, is that that well GIS of course sets those standards but there are insurance company that we can ask the mayor to consider and search out others but it also every time you change the insurance it has to be bargained and negotiated and so it's a it's a long process but I think a commitment this community has made a commitment actually you know what, I'm gonna let Councilor Carney talk because I I'm almost parroting her words and I don't want to take thank you from, I, so. and um, First of all, I do want to thank the committee as well. I may have thanked you the first time, but I understand that it really is. I actually served on this committee uh, eight years ago when we first met. I think the charter precluded a council serving, councilor serving on the committee this time. I served with then councilor uh, Marilyn Richards. Dennis, I think, was on the committee at the time. And we, um, we only had the charge at that time to look at the mayor's salary with the understanding eight years ago that, that the next step would be to look at the council salary. So there was, again, another eight years before that happened. Um, the point that I wanted to make was that um, it's very difficult to take this, even though the charter, the charter requires it, to take an elected officials compensation review board as a separate issue than compensation generally for city employees. And understanding that all of that is bargained mayor with the uh, various bargaining units. We are a council that has, uh, over the last uh, eight years that I've been here, passed numerous resolutions for uh, living wage employers, uh, for, uh, living and responsible employers, and really sought that out 
to, for Northampton to really, uh, you know, bear a, uh, you know, a light showing that we want to bring, you know, a rising tide will raise all boats, that we really are reaching out to try to help employers raise the standard for all of the employees and private employers, but also realizing that the city is just not there yet placed ourselves in the position of uh, being one of those aspiring employers. So while we have put that out there and we've asked for employers to name themselves, we actually have a recognition and those employers are named each year. I think the city still is in the aspiring employer category. Um, Mayor Collect, correct me That's if I'm correct. wrong. Yes. So we are aspiring. We are aspiring Great. to raise the level of those employees. And I would venture to say that that means that we are and do plan, and it's my hope that we would raise the level of, of health insurance benefits and compensation for those employees, those people that are working for the city, to at least meet the level that we've put out as a standard that we ask for for private employers in the city. That being said, it is one reason why I, as Councillor Dwight and Councillor Sierra and other people have said, I am committed to the belief that uh, uh, as a responsible employer, we should offer health insurance benefits even to those part-time employees who cannot access health insurance right now and are working three and five jobs to try to make enough money to be able to buy on the open market. So rather than say that we should lower the standards of some employees and that's what we are we are employees and i also question whether or not we're part-time employees us <laughs> have alluded to the fact that we work well over the number of hours that would be considered part-time and we're salaried i guess if you were stipended i don't take the health insurance and it's because i am fortunate enough to have a, a, a day job with a good insurance uh, plan that my employer offers, and I don't feel the need to. Uh, I, at the same time, don't even consider it when I consider the colleagues that I have on the city council, on the school committee, and the board of trustees, who I know access the health insurance benefits because that's what they need. And so um, my hope, and I, I, was, I was quite disappointed to see that, that benefits were then taken. I'm more concerned with the retention of benefits even than with the raising of salaries because I really think that in this day and age we should be seeking to cover more employees. We should be seeking to cover more people than putting more people off. And I do, as Councillor Dwight and Councillor Klein have uh, mentioned, think it, it raises the, it opens the possibility for many more people to seek public office. So that's a point at which I think many of us just really basically disagreed with the with that piece, it, and, and unfortunately it came off, I mean, there was a disagreement on that point. And Can I just make yes. one other point, which is, and I don't know if this is in the report or not, but I just sort of remember this from the conversations, and maybe it's an unfair assumption, but a lot of us made the assumption that it had nothing to do with the level of work or the hours you put in, but based on the stipend, that this was not anybody's living, you know? <laughs> you were getting such a small amount of money that there must be some other income that people are living on in some way. And so I think that was also a connection for us, um, that this was not your job in terms of paying your bills. You may be working hard, and do you know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm right. I hear what you're saying, it is but 10, at 20, the 35, same time, so many I'm of us, not, no, those of us who have been doing this job do, do factor this into our, our budget and our we're employees, and those of us who've been doing this for eight or ten years, it is part of our, it's part of our entire compensation. Mm -hmm. We work 60 hours, and this is one piece of it. So um, I, I understand where you're looking at the number, but, but clearly, it, it, if you look at a figure that hasn't changed in 24 years, while um, the, the level of work, the cost of living, and all of that has increased, um, as has the workload. I mean, given a lot of, uh, given technology and many other things that make uh, counselors far more accessible to, to their constituents than maybe they were in the past with no answering machines even, you know, never mind uh, email or anything else. 
So. Well, and as, the, yeah, I was going to say, as Todd said, we make the recommendations. You don't have to. No, and yes, and that, that's why yeah. I, 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 so. that's why many of us looked at the recommendations and found, and you know, had some real basic disagreements. As as Councillor Sierra pointed out, it was clear that for many councillors, what was being offered was a net sum loss and not a net sum gain. For myself, it's a net sum gain because I'm not taking the health insurance. At the same time, I know that um, I may need the health insurance. I, I don't know. All I know is that right now it's my second job. I have two jobs. I have a day job and I have a night job. And what's offered to what I know is when I lose, if I lose my, if I lose my day job, I have the option to, to fall yeah. back on health insurance policy from my night job. You know, and many people do that, you know, and that's allowed by law by COBRA and ERISA and all of those things that allow a person to, when they've lost one, they can access, you know, regardless of when the open period is and, and all of those things. But I don't think that there's, it's not my sense that anyone on any of these bodies, be it the City Council, School Committee, or Board of Trustees, abuses these, abuses this, these benefits in any way, but those that access these benefits do, do so because they need to. And I don't begrudge any of my fellow councillors and would actually, uh, this is where Councillor Spector and I disagreed. Uh, it's my, it was, as someone who, and he's not here, but I know that he has said he's someone who, uh, who used the health insurance but said that he thought we should get rid of it. I'm on the other side where I don't access the health insurance benefit, but I do believe it's a very important benefit that should be available to those, those members. And as the point was made about other part-time officials, I think we should bring, find a way to bring them in so in the same aspiring way that we have claimed that we are. If we are an aspiring employer to be uh, reflective of responsible employment and the living wage and all of those things, that that's something I hope we move towards. I think that's why we re recommended effectively a doubling of the salary. Um, but just to clarify the point about employees of the city, I think an assumption, we, we actually discussed this number a number of times in, in Board. There was a, an assumption that part of the, um, that public service was a big component of part-time elected officials' work. That it, they weren't typical employees of the city, um, that they were, they were serving sort of the public interest in a, in a very unique role. And that we really shouldn't be looking at this as full-time employ employment, trying to figure out how, many, how much they're getting paid per hour, because it was unique. Public service was a component, and we all felt that was important. Um, we felt that uh, paying a stipend to attract uh, a di diverse group of candidates was also important, but public service was, was a big component. So we, this notion that you're just like any other city employees, that wasn't, the, that wasn't our working assumption. So but I'll, 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 let, I'll let Dennis. Dennis, why don't you... Uh you step up to the podium, Dennis. Is there anything not uh, yet been said? <laughs> I, I am imbued with the wisdom of the world at this point, but yes, you can add to it. Well, you know, solving the health care problem in America is a place where angels may fear to tread, much less the I agree. advisory board. Uh, you know, we, we can't solve that. We had a specific mission. We had a charge. We explained the method. We came to our conclusions. You're free to accept them, reject them, amend them. Uh, you know, for the reasons, because reasonable people can disagree. Uh, and, and so I understand that. And um, so where we had just sort of come from, I just sort of want to do a little history of 32. We're all stuck by the law. Chapter 32B governs health insurance for cities and towns. It spells out who gets it, how they get it, whether they're eligible for it. And, you know, unless the legislature chooses to change that, that's what we live, you know, that's the world that we live in. Historically, uh, it, it, uh, I guess I would say to Councillor Adams, uh, we don't need to reconcile anything. You know, it is what it is. The reality is, is in the past, health insurance was cheap. Everybody had Master Health, Blue Cross, Blue Shield Plus. We did pay as you go. There was never any OPEB benefits. There was never any increases in health insurance. The law was that elected officials could get their health insurance. Nobody ever questioned it, because um, everybody had it. So, you know, when Massachusetts had universal health care, and now with the Affordable Care Act, because it's such a huge thing in our society, there are now more ways for people to access health insurance. There are subsidies for the people who can't afford it. 
I don't know who on this committee takes it or whether they need it because they can't afford to buy it or are they choosing it because the city has a better health plan and it's cheaper for them to do it this way. You know, I'm not going to make judgments about that. So the only thing I can say is increasingly, you know, I'm a member of the Mass Municipal Personnel Association. You are all members of the Mass Municipal Association. I was just on the phone with them today, um, you know, to ascertain where is the state of health insurance with communities in Massachusetts currently. So as health insurance keeps going up, and I know what happened in, you know, here, just like in Greenfield, we switched when we had a 33 percent increase on Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we could because uh, Maya had, or Mega had you know, uh, uh, underestimated, you know, what their claims were, that we, we could not afford that. So health insurance is a real cost. It is true that it was not to wholly, our charge was not to make people whole for every single counselor. We didn't do that. It's a, it's a partial sort of offset. In that sense, it's an equity issue. I'm not so sure that I would, when I asked my city counselor, uh, who I like and is very good, <laughs> to say, if he said to me, well, why did you run? Well, I ran for the health insurance, frankly. Uh, I'm not so sure I want that to be the answer from my city counselor in terms of the public service and their commitment to serving their community. And that is a difficult balance. When people ask me to run for office, gladly you stepped ahead. I said, run me over with a bus. I already have a jo full-time job, I don't, uh, and I have several part-time jobs. So, uh, you know, basically what's been happening in the Commonwealth is because of that, the legislature, I believe it was in 2011, under the Health Care Reform Act, just like they did with the Pension Reform Act, changed Section 2 of 32B to say that cities and towns could decide whether or not they wanted to give health insurance benefits to elected officials. Part-time, full-time, I'm not going to go there. It's a, it's a different sort of class. Um, and so they made it a may. In the way it works is in a city by executive order of the mayor or in towns by majority vote of the board of the selectmen, they can choose whether or not to give uh, elected officials insurance or not. I found out to my surprise that the city charter, when it was rewritten, says that you shall receive health insurance benefits. Uh, you may want to ask the city solicitor or the attorney general. I don't know if state law trumps and the mayor can issue an executive order and you have nothing <coughs> to say about it or whether the charter trumps. I'm not going there. Um, so that's the state of the law. When I talked to the MMA this morning, and, and I understand there's different forms of government. You know, and there's all kinds, you know, town managers, town administrators, if you're towns. Uh, you know, we are the city known as the town of Greenfield is the first uh, order of, the, uh, of our charter because they wanted a bum to elect or throw out as the case may be, but they wanted to retain the, you know, a town. So um, the, the issue became for us when we made our recommendation, the trend seems to be going because of the cost. When I spoke to the MMA this morning, only 40% of the city towns in the Commonwealth currently now offer health insurance. More and more the trend is going the other way. It's true that when I personally contacted through my um, MMPA system, the 24 cities and towns that we did, you know, I spoke to my colleagues, they're all struggling with the same thing. The city councils in those cities are struggling with the same thing. Their stipends for city council range anywhere from 3,000 in East Hampton, you know, uh, Amesbury is 3,000, Beverly, you know, okay, they get 11,700, you know, it, it ranges all over the place. So that was some of the things we tried to do with that. In Greenfield, um, the mayor by executive order took away health insurance last year for the elected officials. Some of those elected officials worked for the state. They could go to the GIC, they chose to continue to have it through us. The city council uh, in Greenfield voted themselves a stipend for the first time, you know, a salary, um, not as high as what we're recommending, uh, recommending. But they also specifically put in the ordinance that they would not be eligible for health insurance. <coughs> Ironically, uh, although I told that to Todd, 
they did vote themselves a parking pass for anywhere in the city for free, including the parking meters. Uh, so, you know, perks are perks. I, you know, I'm not, so far the citizenship has not arisen because of, well, if I go to Greenfield Markets, you know, people talk to me. So I, I should be able to park for free when I go get my coffee because people talk to me. You know, I don't know. You know, I, I get that. So that seems to be where the trending seems to go. So that also influenced us. Um, I agree that health insurance is a big issue. The question becomes if all of the city councilors, you know, took a family plan and, uh, you know, say approximately $12,000 a year, uh, you know, I, I don't know why people take, you know, that it is a significant cost to the city. Whether the city should bear it or not based on the various approaches you take, well, I think that we should have it because I'm not really part-time. I really am like an employee, although I'm an elected official. I'm a self-employed businessman, and if I had to go to the exchange, um, I would have to pay more. I think that it's something that I deserve. I under understand that it's very difficult for you to have to go on record to say, well, I think that it should be part of our compensation. I mean, it, it's the compensation is the benefit. You know, I have that with our employees all the time is, is well, you know, my sick time is that that's, that's mine. I said, no, actually, that's a benefit. You have your compensation, you have a benefit. The benefit has a dollar figure attached to it. So all of you, when you say you're making $50,000 a year, we're paying $14,000 a year towards your family plan. I'm paying this amount towards your Medicare tax. We're paying this amount. In fact, your salary is $73,000, although you only make 50. And then, of course, they're like, I, that's not true. I, that's not in my paycheck. But I go, I know. But if you, we were not paying for it, this is what the value of that is for you. And you know, so I, underst I understand that, and it's a difficult thing for you have well, to drives, do. You know, what drives my concern, of course, is um, less actually, honestly, for me. I mean, I, I'm not even convinced, even before this discussion, that I was going to run for re-election anyway. <laughs> but the, the fact it might, one, because I believe, actually, I do believe it's a moral obligation of any institution. I, that, that I hold, and I've held that forever. But um, it's also the absence of health insurance which, by the way, we do receive, we pay into. I should point out that this is, you know, we pay, I pay my stipend into, uh, into Yeah, no, see, so it's 80-20, yeah. you know, yeah. I get that. 80-20 split. I, my insurance policy costs the same as the mayor's. Mm -hmm. or, and and the, the concern is, of course, that it would actually create another one. We have enough disincentives to run for council. I think for, for, for anyone who's watching this meeting tonight will probably go, what in the hell? I would, <laughs> I'd be mad to do this, but this would create one more wrinkle, uh, one more disincentive. Um, and you're right. I don't think it's a question of whether someone, if, if someone said they were running for the health insurance, I certainly wouldn't vote for them. But I mean, well, I still might if I like. Well, <laughs> that's the point. Is is if it, 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 it's what's more relevant to the point and to the point is, I'm not running because of the health insurance. Right. I can't afford it. And to say that to someone else or to have someone th th that we move, we, uh, it's a death of a thousand cuts. And eventually, um, you know, and I agree. I, I actually personally, I, you know, the issue of public service, I've always held, always held from the time I first got elected and every time everyone heard my stipend, I said I should not run for my job. Mm -hmm. I should run for public service. Uh, it, hard case to make for the city council in Boston, for instance. Uh, but, the, you know, because they're clearly running for their careers. They're running for all their benefits, their office, their cars, their $120,000 salary, all that la di da. Of course, bigger city, bigger brains, much smarter people who work a lot harder than we do. But the fact is, is that I, I, I actually, just like Councilor Carney, I have really no issue with the stipend. Um, it's, you know, the difference between a few thousand dollars here or there, um, I, I'm able to squander that pretty easily one way or the other. But the fact is that the health insurance actually is, is critical in some sense because, as I think, it's, it's a critical municipal and uh, it's a critical responsibility of private employers, I believe. I, I know that I don't stand in the majority if I were to run into Congress and scream this, but the fact is, is that that there does seem to be a trend in the nation to understand the absent uh, single-payer health care that, that given this dysfunctional system that we do have, 
the, the most opportunities that we can make available to make sure that people are covered, the better. And, and I'm, my concern is, I think I share with Councilor Carney, is that it's a thin edge of the wedge. And unfortunately, it's our thin edge of the wedge, poison pill and all. And, and, it's, and we are going to take a lot of political heat should we not revoke the health insurance. That's a given. We already have. Uh, the Gazette has written editorials and uh, the public has responded uh, rather emphatically. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of people going, you go for it. I've heard a lot of people saying, why do you even get paid at all? You should be doing this for free. Well, we do not think and, that. No, I know that. And, <laughs> and, and I, I know that. And in fact, I'm so grateful for that. I'm remark. I, I, but the fact is, is that that as a political issue, as no, we it all is. recognize, I mean, it's, it's, you live it's, in a goldfish. It's completely and we're by law. I mean, unfortunately, state law says yes. you must work 20 hours a week or more to receive health insurance. I know. Right. We, we when the domestic partnership came before same-sex right. marriage, spouses define. I mean, you know, right. dependents are defined as spouse, as children. Mm -hmm. It says all of that in the law, and it's and they amended the law, the legislature amended the law just like for retirement. You all were eligible for retirement. I had former selectmen come to me and say, so I get $2,500 a year and I've been a selectman for 20 years. So if I go get a job at the university for $80,000 or $100,000 a year for the last three years, I'm going to get $80,000 a year? Yes. That was the pension reform law. Now you must earn at least $5,000. You know, you're eligible for that. Right. And, I, and I agree that from a you know, if it was up, if I was king of the forest, you know, everybody would have health insurance. My friends in Europe, my friends in Holland, I happen to be Dutch, my friends in Canada, you know, they have a system that is completely different than ours. And what a lot of people don't realize is that how our system came to be was in World War II, when they couldn't give raises, Samuel Gompers, the great labor leader, said, what do you want? And he said, more. And they said, more what? And he said, more. And they gave health insurance. They started giving these benefits. That's the history of how that came here. And so, you know, we struggled with that, but it was trying to come up with how to give more money for the time that you actually do, deal with the issue of what seems to be trending and, and, and the difference between counselors that take it and counselors that don't. There is some sort of, we can't make everybody whole. Right. And I think, I think, you know, establish it that we have no dispute with the recommendation. Um, we may have a difference, and I'm not going to speak for we, I'm going to say that I, we do have a difference of opinion about, um, you, you know, the, 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 the value, not the value, but the, 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 imperative of health. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. And um, we don't have a problem. I mean, we didn't expect everybody to go, oh, great. No, no. You know? I, as I understand <laughs> that you fully expected resistance and that we were going to firebomb your homes, and I'm glad we didn't do that. I mean, but it, it, I want to emphasize my gratitude to this volunteer committee, and I want to apologize for all hard feelings that have been experienced during the course of this. Um, I have to own my share of that because it's my job to make sure to facilitate communication. So uh, I don't think I did a crackerjack job on that, but you know I'm underpaid. I give Any everybody <laughs> some, I give everybody some leeway. I try not to take anything personally anymore. Okay, well I appreciate that. I the now I'm actually I'm going to consider this as a motion if 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 uh, if I can get a second. And the motion would be to. Um, to actually postpone the vote, and I and I realize that we put we we're you know we're creeping up past our witching hour where we're not allowed to meet anymore, um, but I'm going to ask that the council consider that we uh, withdraw the vote on this and reconsider, possibly with the help of any of you members who are willing to continue to participate, and possibly maybe the formation of another uh, committee, maybe even a public vetting uh, discussion about uh, tar focusing on how we can promote greater involvement and engagement in them. The only thing I would recommend is, is uh, w since we did work hard, and I do believe because of the time constraints mm -hmm. for getting the money that you would sever the issue of health insurance from. Well, actually, the motion would actually compensation. include. Would, so you can vote on the compensation right, so I'm going piece. To, we're actually going to, uh, the motion would actually be to move ahead and continue, and because we're not discussing that issue yet, but uh, to move ahead with the salaries that we've already approved. Because uh, we firmly and categorically believe that that's, uh, that, that's I don't a think there's an to do. ounce of dissent here. So. 
Uh, I'm sorry. Is there a motion? Should I, should I, should I just speak? Yeah. Yeah, there is a motion. I, I don't know. I haven't heard a second. Well, I, so. I have a question. Are you asking for a motion to defer both items, the one that refers to the... No, I should be clear. Uh, the, compensate, well, the compensation package and our stipend, if, as far as those two items, so those for the two elected... Items, for the council. Right. For the, council. Right, for the, for the council's council's school committee and trustees. Right. Okay, so it's those two items. So, so the three what, items, yes. So he, just so that you understand, I think as you seem a little confused, what, what Councilor Dwight is asking is that we defer both the um, both the ordinance with uh, the order pertaining to uh, health insurance uh, benefits and the order pertaining to salaries for counselors, school committee, and trustees. Oh. Both of those, to look at those as a package, and move forward with the two that were recommended regarding Although, the, uh, for the mayor I mean, and the, the city one, clerk. The mayor, and city the mayor clerk. and the city oh, okay. clerk. But also, also to acknowledge that there's a fundamental flaw, as, as uh, Todd pointed out, the fact that the, um, regardless of what we do on the vote, relative to compensation, uh, uh, the benefits package it doesn't matter. Uh, there's there is no order to revoke is the point. But right. in any event, to defer that, and should we come to that point, and I. We may come to that point, but what I think clearly we need more, we need to do more deliberation and I think, uh, you know, and chew on this poison pill a little longer just to savor every drop. Uh, I would urge yourself to, give, I would urge to give yourself a raise, but you're the, you're the boss of you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and now I actually have a motion on the floor, so uh, well, actually, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, well, actually we don't, I don't have a second yet. But. Well, I, and, and I actually agree with uh, Dennis. Dennis that Maybe the, the, the issue that we have here is one of whether or not elect, part time elected, so called part time elected officials um, should continue to receive, have uh, the option to receive health mm -hmm. health care benefits. Correct. It's right. not a question about the dollar amount. We haven't had a question about so that. Could vote. We took I, a vote on that. And I have to recognize Councilor Adams or we turn into pumpkins. Okay. Yes, yeah. go ahead. You weren't going to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we extend past the line. Right, second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I thought we were on the motion. Okay, now you, yeah. I would, I would really, really hope that we don't do that. And the reason is we have a set of recommendations. They gave clear indication that they don't want to do anymore. I don't think we should have a new committee to get new recommendations. I mean, what would be the point of that, to see if we like those more? I mean, I, I, they made their recommendations. They stand by them. I think we should vote on them tonight. Yeah. Um, there, actually, there is no second on it, so I, uh, no, we're actually not debating a motion yet. So I'll, I, I'll actually <laughs> withdraw my motion. You, you withdrawing your second? I thought I made the motion. Yeah, she was, did. was it who made it? Bill made, it. <laughs> no, I didn't made the motion. The chair. <laughs> uh, you're right. So yeah, I can make I can make motions. As okay. Chair. So we did we did bestow that power <laughs> on me. Well, I, I, I will second, second the motion okay. at least so we can discuss for purposes of discussion. Yes. Okay. okay. So. Uh, and Councilor Adams has weighed in. Any other thoughts? Uh, on hearing on hearing some of the discussion, while I understand and appreciate some of the rationale Councilor Dwight gave in terms of having a broad, robust discussion, maybe even community discussion around this issue, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm also I'm also. Uh, Persuaded that we've heard about the report, we know that the committee doesn't is not prepared. We have a fundamental agreement regarding health insurance. That's the that's where the disagreement is, and it's not about the pay. Exactly. And so I I, I think that we should move forward with both of the both of the orders that were presented that were voted on last time. And I agree with Councilor Adams that we, it would be best we'd be best served to move forward on these and put it behind us. For clarification, um, what would be the length of time? We actually we we have till June for a final decision to June. Otherwise, it rolls over okay. into uh, the next council because then uh, the next council would have to, and it wouldn't become effective till 2018, whatever decision was made. But I mean, I think there was time. That's embedded there that allows us to. Can we can I ask a question? Sure. Would the hope be to form a new committee? Not necessarily. My hope actually is to form a new form and creative way of compensation that conforms to Mass General Law that promotes greater incentives for a broader 
uh, representative body. That's my hope. I don't think that this does that. Not uh, no knock on them, but no knock on. I mean, it's it, as it stood, it doesn't. And so that's that's my hope. <laughs> it's a it's a deathly pall. <laughs> um, any other thoughts, or otherwise we'll call the vote on the uh, on the motion. Councillor. Yes. So you're saying we have up until June, correct? Yes, I'm not sure what the Can date certain. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you have something to say? I mean, I think that um, you know the the value of exploring a more creative um, method could be um, to to do what Council President and Councilor. Klein and others have, have said, which is to try and encourage different kinds of people to run, people who aren't able to do it today. Um, um, the more I think about this, you know, I, I do have questions about whether, what process we use, whether we should do it ourselves, um, or whether an independent body is still necessary in that case. So um, after hearing all this discussion, I'm still, that's a point that I'm still thinking about. But the value, I think, is very clear. And, I, my only point is, is, is having, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, you next in the, the uh, um, having the cover of an appointed committee. Um, I think that we we have the opportunity to do the, the ultimate responsibility is on us, mm -hmm. and with that can be to convene forums and th the like. And in the absence of this already appointed and standing committee, um, that ostensibly committees are there to provide. Council, but also, as Todd has pointed out, uh, political coverage. Uh, and uh, that fig leaf, I think, got ripped off some time ago, and we stand here exposed, and I think we, we, own, we should own it. And, and it should be also noted that, failing anything else, we agree with either the rec we get to vote uh, some months later to vote on the recommendations as they've been presented, or not, or to modify them. But the fact is, is that I think there's an opportunity here that I don't want to squander if it's possible. I do think there's a certain energy, or at least I'm, I'm sensing an energy of, or a, a, a desire to try and, and make that the focus, at least as we figure out salaries and stipends for, uh, for representative governance. And Councilor Adams wasn't asking, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't see how we could go forward without this committee. This committee is no longer interested. This committee had a charge. They met that charge. They met the requirements of the charter. If we don't want to accept the recommendations, we should do that tonight and take the heat in that way. We should own it. But I don't understand how we even go forward without this committee. And, and to me, um, and, and frankly, it doesn't matter that much for those who are concerned. It does look like to the general public that we just, <laughs> that we have just decided to go forward without this committee because we didn't like the recommendations anyhow. And I, I, think it, I, think it's, I think it makes no sense all around and it's just a bad move. A uh, politically bad move, or in, sure. in all ways, I, because I politically bad move for as far as I'm concerned, be damned. Well, but, uh, well, but, if for those who are okay, fine, fine. It's, right. it's forget about politics. Look at the policy. They they recommended the policy. We're going forward without them. It's bad for policy. So I mean, I I, I feel very strongly that's not the way to go. I think we should take this vote tonight and and and, and own it. Um, the ramifications, one way or another. I mean, for, the, for the sake of argument, I think regardless of whether we postpone and look to a more creative system or whether we take the vote tonight, uh, the council is still not following exactly what the advisory board has recommended either way. So in the spirit of, of politics, um, politics be damned, uh, I'm sure that'll be, that'll be bleeped out. Uh, uh, you know, uh, e either way, um, you're open to that. The question is what is right? My only comment would be the more I think about it is we do own it more if we dispense with this vote and then we always have time to come back with our own proposal independent of, of that um, rather than extending this. But um, I, could, I frankly see the merits of both sides. Yeah. I mean, last time councillors spoke about how um, this is an independent committee and we should 
um, honor some of their recommendations, if not all of them. Now we're going to be going forward without them. I mean, that, that makes no sense. It, it just doesn't. Council of the Barge. Just for an example with the Charter Commission, we had one group. We did what we had to do. You were on the first Charter Commission with me, Councilor. And then the second Charter Commission, there was a different, a different selection of people on it. So we do have one group that apparently <coughs> dissolved. So why can that not continue with another group like we did with the Charter Commission? I can see what, like Bill is saying, going in a different direction, which would be a second group that we would get. Okay. Well, just thinking logistically, I mean, six, six months goes by very quickly. And the process that we have for naming any sort of committee, our names are submitted to the mayor's office. The mayor then submits those names to us for consideration. Then they're referred to the, to the appointments and evaluations committee. We're talking two months before any committee gets back. And then if we were to follow by our committee structure, and then hearings or, or other things would have to happen in one of our subcommittees. So uh, it, it's kind of pushing it right up until a budget time and I mean it is it's all doable but it would require an enormous amount of um, expedited work and outreach I would think even in this uh, this original committee there was a significant amount of outreach and it was done targeted I know that I think that uh, some of the requirements were actually looking at folks who had human resources experience and I think that we've kind of we, we've broadened the net and we have a pool of people who <laughs> That, and is it a different sort of uh, experience that we're looking at now? Or, so I think that we're, it, it's, I understand and appreciate the motives here. I just find it a little bit, it may be a little bit daunting, even though we say that we have six months, my sense is that that's a, a, a blink from now. And I'm more tempted to go with the Adams recommendation that we move, it, move forward on this. Council Shar. Like a previous vote tonight, we need two thirds of the council, correct? Correct. I thought this, Actually, was, this is a this is a majority. We need two thirds of the entire body by charter. The charter defines the vote on this one. For this motion or for the? For the not for the sec, not for my motion, no, but oh. for the for the general order. Yeah. For, for the general orders. orders. Yeah. For the salary for the salaries. For the salaries. We need um, all right, I'm going to call the question on the motion, so just to <coughs> let it live or die. So, um, okay, so just, just to be clear, the motion is to postpone for the benefits. The so benefits. The salary and the school committee and all the salaries. Yeah, for representative elected bodies, yeah. Uh, Councilor Dwight. Uh, yes. It is to postpone the decision on the orders for uh, covering elected representative bodies. That's the school committee, the uh, uh, the, the trustees, it's okay. vocational. I continue to have another question, though. Could you clarify, I know you called the question, could we clarify how many votes we need to pass the um, the motions, I mean, the, the orders that were before us? The orders have to pass with two-thirds of the entire body and that includes the two members who are not present. With six votes, is that my, my question? Is is it six votes that are needed? Yeah, that's what that's we determined. Yes. Okay. That's okay. That part Question, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, so, two, three, and Councilor Barge, so are we clear? And and and, next and next also next. the uh, benefits package. Okay. Thank you. Well, this is the motion to postpone. Right? This is the motion to postpone. So, uh, and we're already in the roll call, and I said yes. Councillor Klein? No. Councillor Labarge? No. Councillor O'Donnell? No. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Adams? No. Councillor Carney? Yes. The motion fails. Uh, so we're back to the original orders. Um, and any further debate on now, what we're discussing actually is Councilor Adams introduced first um, was, let's just be clear, the uh, uh, which item was it, Jesse? It was. It's, uh, it's 
14304. 14304, right, the benefits. Yeah. So it's only the benefits. So uh, is there any further discussion on this issue? Could you just read the read the order, not the whole order, but just the title of the yeah, order? What you're doing. Uh, this is this is this is the title of the order is the uh, this is the ordinance regarding uh, salaries and benefits and um, for elected officials and covered under benefits, and that is um, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising section five. Chapter 5, 5B five of said code providing compensation of elected officials be ordained uh, that the benefits and expenses, the mayor, city clerk, city council, school committee, and trustees of Smith Vocational Agricultural School shall be able to, eligible to enroll in the city's municipal health insurance. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? All please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. The motion passes. Um, so next up is City Council salary. The site. And that reads, mm -hmm. an order, uh, this is compensation of elected officials, annual compensation for those specified below shall be as follows. Um, this is city council president until January 4, 2016, 5,500. As of January 4, 2016, 10,000. At large city council, 5,000. Uh, that is also January, uh, uh, until January 4, 2016. As of January 4, 2016, it will be 9,500. Ward City Councilor uh, at 5,000 until January 4, 2016. As of January 4, 2016, it will be $9,000 at the proposal. I'll accept the motion and put it on the floor. Second. Discussion. Um, my sense is your original motion to uh, postpone would be more relevant for this particular issue rather than the one that included health care benefits. And I would entertain uh, a motion to postpone this particular item given that I believe your intention was to look more at the salary figure uh, with regard to opening up the possibility for um, a wider group of applicants or contestants for these positions. So while I objected to, um, um, although I, while, while I had some concerns originally around that, because we all originally agreed that we should keep the health insurance benefits. I am open to postponing this discussion, especially since I don't think that there are the votes to pass this this evening, and I think it might be something that might be better considered over uh, some small period of time to look at what might be able to be, what might gain her enough votes to pass, because this, this one will not pass this evening. And I think if it makes sense to look uh, through subcommittee levels or some negotiated way to see whether there would be an, a uh, majority or a supermajority, which we where there would have six votes that would pass. Otherwise, we will be stuck for the next 10 years with a $5,000 salary. No, not uh, correction, not 10 years. It would be the next council term could consider it. It can be considered any term, elected term for the subsequent term. Uh, council Adams. Well, I think that it's reasonable to think that, and I'm guessing, and please correct me if you're wrong, you're here, if, if this committee had known that we would retain our, the, the possibility, the option of part-time elected officials um, keeping their health insurance option, um, I think it's reasonable to assume that they would have recommended a lower stipend. I, I, I don't... I don't know that that's true. I, okay. The sense that I got from, like to I just got the sense. That? We made our recommendations. Yes. I don't know. We didn't, we didn't 
Okay, so it would have been that amount. So looking at, there are two things, compensation and benefits. So we dealt with compensation and the benchmark and we came up with that and then dealt with the benefit part of it in the, within the context of what is the relationship between what Todd had said earlier. So the stipend wouldn't have changed, the stipend recommendation wouldn't have changed had this committee known we would retain our health insurance benefits. Is that is that what I'm hearing? No, no, no. it's speculative. We did. It, it, you, we did you're gonna have to stuff. speak at the podium, you guys. I'm sorry. I hate to do that to you, but. Yes. That's sort of speculative. We took this as sort of one big, um, one big issue, and and we did take it in sequence. Um, but we were we were thinking about this all as one big package that was balanced in certain ways and maybe not balanced the way you would want it to be, which is fine. Um, but we didn't uh, sort of game this out with alternate scenarios. It was hard enough to try to reach some sort of balanced consensus, um, but we we didn't we didn't game this out with alternative scenarios. So um, that would be speculative. And another point that Vicky wanted to me to remind you of, and. In our report, we recommend that the council revisits this every two years. Is that correct? Every two years. Um, I saw that. Yeah. Um, and my understanding is that the the charter just specifies that this advisory board has to be convened at least every ten years. That's it can be convened every years. every right. every council session if you that's, like. That's my understanding. Yeah. So, but, um, just to Dennis, was I was I correct in hearing you just? 15 minutes ago or 10 minutes ago when you heard us say that we were going to vote to um, to take up the issue of health insurance and that we were going to take up both of those items and I thought I heard you say well I hope you'll pay to give yourselves a raise right okay I thought I heard you say that so if that, if that but that was my comment about you're the boss as you but to me I don't see why you can't sure sever those what questions I heard because I think that's what Councillor Adams misunderstood at least from the one individual who stood up here and said that did you hear that then? Yes. Okay, so that's what. Uh, yeah, I think the difference is Dennis was speaking his personal right. mind, which yes. he's certainly free to do, and, right. and I guess I'm trying to think about the committee and what we did, and, and I don't know what other people's opinions are, and so I wouldn't really speak for them. I don't think Dennis is no, speaking I was just, for us either. No, that was yeah. just my opinion that yeah. Yeah. why not sever them and, and right. give everybody their money. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, it's my personal opinion. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm offering the, the, the reason I'm offering a postponement is maybe that among this body, um, we have some time to uh, deliberate and negotiate because I still have not heard from my colleagues who are prepared to vote in opposition to a salary increase. I don't know. I know uh, and maybe we could have the discussion tonight at 1120. But my sense is that, you know, I don't understand um, what the reasoning is to not move forward with a salary increase that hasn't been increased in 24 years. And I just haven't heard the reason. I could be persuaded. I could be persuaded to keep us at 5,000. But I just haven't heard that from counselors to my right. And I think that my sense is that there's opposition and that this won't, we're, we're staying here. And so I'd like to hear, either hear that tonight or ask for a postponement. Um, Hang on, uh, Councilor Adams. You have a point. Yes, point. I'm, I'm looking at um, the, uh, I believe, 24 cities benchmark, and I noticed that the average per, per the average for city councilors in that benchmark is 7,598. So I, I I move um, to amend the amounts to 7,500 for each councilor ward or at large, 8,000 for council president. I think I have a motion on the floor to post. Well, I didn't, I didn't oh, hear oh, you. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, 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 My bad, I, I, I didn't I, recognize that as a motion. So. Okay, well, I, I was trying to make that as a motion to postpone that discussion. Okay, so first, we'll, is there a second on Councilor Carney's motion? Because I, I would be inclined to second that. Thank you. So. Um, and if, if I could speak to the motion then? Yes, go ahead. It's 11.20, sure. and yes, I think at this point to be offering alternate figures, um, I, I, I just really feel like this requires more discussion. I don't, uh, you know, this is, this is something that at this, and, and we're missing two counselors. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Councilor Spector and Councilor Murphy who would have something probably to offer in this discussion. My sense is, given that this is a this is a pretty important matter in terms of the salary, that this should at least be postponed until the next meeting, where we could have a more thorough discussion about changes if we're going to be actually changing that recommendation and actually going back and look at, you know, look at that. I know that, for example, I heard Councilor Spector say that he thought that the council that the, the figure should be fifteen thousand. I mean, I don't think any of us agree to that, but, uh, you know, there are some reasons. We can look at those, and I don't understand. I still haven't heard from Councilors well, Shearer uh, and, o and let, me make, let me be clear. Did you just amend the motion to postpone till the next meeting? Is that what you just... Amend it, well, uh, or postpone until uh, to have a, a discussion, whether it's at the next meeting or, re or referred to a subcommittee where we can have a discussion about this, but... I don't think that we can have a very I, thorough discussion at 11:20. Yeah, no, I agree, and my only concern is I don't want this to get lost in limbo. If, if, if I, I think it's a, I will support the second amended second, I, uh, the amended motion to um, postpone it to the next meeting so that we can get those councils to weigh in on whether they want to continue a postponement and, and spread it out further. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is to that motion. Uh, discussion on those points. Roll call, please. Postpone. So this is for postponement to the next council meeting. The vote on the stipend. Council Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. No. Councilor Scherer. Yes. Councilor Adams. No. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Motion carries. So it's postponed till the next council meeting February 5th. Which again, we're hoping to get everybody to show up. <laughs> All right. Boy, we are cracking. We are. <laughs> we, um, if you want to wait for the vote, it's going to come later on uh, the mayor's salary and the clerk's salary. Yeah. But I think you know how that's going to break. And. Um, School committee. And the, oh, I'm sorry. In the school committee, I actually want to wait for that. Uh, we'll accept a motion on on. Actually, do we? Do I think we those. I, I think I the council committee that. and trustees are all, are all on part of one. Five, five, eight. Yeah. yeah. No, they so they're, they're all covered. Yep. Under the order for um, city council salary, school committee, and other salaries are covered under the same order that we post voted to postpone. City council salary separate than school community. Oh, that's right. It's just city council president at large. All right. Are you may, I, I would presume that the motion, uh, Councillor Carney, Councillor Carney, the motion actually it's I, quite. I meant it for, to, for the all three bodies for the council. So move them as a group. And, yeah, I meant that's how I meant that. Okay, but we'll, let's just for coverage, let's do that as a vote. Okay. And uh, second. And there's a second from Councillor Adams. Is that to move them as a group or? To move well, the I, remaining two I, as I a group. I meant to have all postponed. those three. That's president. Only three? That's school trustees. Okay. No, it's not. Not, not no, Just. that is school committee and other salaries and uh, yeah. And then we have the city council salary stipend. About the school committee and other sides. I took out the mayor. Right, right, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, I am. I took the mayor. You guys? You guys? Hello? Yeah. That's me banging a gavel. Uh, this order uh, is compensation elected officials, and that's at large school committee members, ward school committee members, uh, trustees of Smith Vocational Agricultural School. Uh, elector under the Oliver Smith will, of course, which is staying at ten dollars. Trustees under the will of Charles E. Forbes and Community Preservation at Large. Um, and the motion was to postpone. Yes. And it was seconded by Councilor Adams. Is that right? For the for the sub uh, school committee and the trustees. So there's side. no group here. It's this is just one. Right. Piece. It's all masses. Yes. Yes. So stipend. So uh, we can do that with a voice vote, I believe, for postponement. So all those in favor. Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. Any opposed? Any no. abstentions? Okay. Are you having an opposition here? <clears throat> oh, okay. You oppose? Okay, so there's one no. 
Um, all right, let's get back. We, uh, we have to approve minutes. Counselors, we have to approve minutes, and we, you know. Move to approve. We're going to, okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? The, the, oh, oh you, there's some corrections. Okay. Uh, the correction on um, the vote for the, sorry, I'm so <laughs> tired, uh, the, for this uh, CDC for the lumberyard. The vote's incorrect. Um, it should be six yes, two no, one abstention, uh, because I was also a no vote on that. So that's on page uh, 294. All right, we're good. And action. Sure. Page 300, in the last paragraph. Uh, it says Councilor O'Donnell moved to take yeah. these items as a group, and then it lists um, seven yes, two no on that motion. However, it lists me as a no vote, which is incorrect because I made the motion. And it also lists Council President Dwight, which I think perhaps is incorrect, but I'm not, I didn't watch the video. So okay, I, so. My motion would be to review that and check. Okay, what, what item is it though? The amendment to take the City Council and School Committee items as a group. is to accept the minutes as amended. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The um, we're up to appointments. This is a new appointment to the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, this is comes with a positive recommendation from the Committee on Rules, Orders, and Appointments and Ordinances. Uh, Tony Hochstead of 22 Fruit Street. Ms. Hochstead will replace Joe DeFazio on the CPC as the Northampton Housing Authority representative, and her term will expire January 2018. I'll accept the motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. It. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I think Tony is the perfect candidate for it. So, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions. This is a new appointment to the Northampton Arts Council. Esther White of 17 Summer Street, Northampton. Uh, Ms. White, upon approval, will fill the unexpired term of Sarah Marcus, and her term will expire on June 30th, 2015. This comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance. Mm -hmm. approved. Any discussion? I'm sorry, am I, am I moving? The, the, you're okay? No, I'm okay. fine. No. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, this is also a new appointment to the Agricultural Committee. This is Timothy Smith of 13 River Road. Mr. Smith, if approved, will fill the unexpired term of Margaret Gifford. The term of this appoint appointment will expire June 2017. This is to be referred to ordinance. Move referral. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, now <laughs> we get to recess for finance mm -hmm. at 1130. And uh, in, in the absence of Councilor Murphy, Councilor Adams will be serving as chair of finance. We go into recess and convene with Councilor Adams' as chair. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Shera. Here. Okay. First financial order is 15350, financial order to surplus parking spaces for trash receptacles. Is there a motion on first reading? So moved. Is there a second? Yes. Why not go ahead and read it? Good morning, counselors. Peach <laughs> Jack. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that whereas the orderly and efficient disposal and recycling of solid waste and recyclable materials from downtown businesses require a central location, and whereas 
The City of Northampton's parking lots provide the most convenient locations for several areas and whereas Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 30B requires the permission of the Northampton City Council the surplus interest in land. Now therefore it is ordered that the council surpluses the following parking spaces for use for trash disposal containers. Masonic lot, three spaces. Armory lot, six spaces. Strong lot, three spaces. Fasano lot, one space. These spaces are to be made available for lease for a five year period. Said lease is to be executed by the mayor. Move to no, did. Sorry, oh, and um, this is similar to the uh, James House that I had to come back to you because we have to renew these leases um, for the folks that uh, that put dumpsters here in town, and so we are due now to renew the leases, and so we have to renew the surplus order uh, all over again. So that's what this is basically doing. No, we're not changing anything, adding anything. The dumpsters stay where they are. We just have to renegotiate the leases, and you have to resurplus them. So. There. So the cost of the rental will stay the same as it is, right? We, um, uh, yeah, we, uh, when you mean the, in terms of what we lease them for, yeah, we're, we're, um, uh, we're pretty much, as far as I can tell, going to stick, have the same providers that have been doing it before. Yeah. And how much so. do we rent them? It's, it's, it's an, it's about roughly 200, I think it's about $200 a month, uh, to put the dumpster there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's what they average. So, uh, are there any further questions from there? Is there a motion to send this forward to the full council with a positive recommendation? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, we now move to financial orders for budgetary transfers. Um, number 15.351. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that the following FY 2015 budgetary transfers be and hereby may, are, are made. Um, from, the contributed, from the Contributory Retirement Department, um, other post employment benefits, actuari actu actuarial services, $1,102 to be transferred to. The contrib contributory retirement, non-contributory retirement, uh, in the amount of one thousand one hundred and two dollars. Workers' compensation department. The description is workers' compensation. The amount's nine thousand one hundred forty-one dollars. That's recommended to be transferred to the workers' comp uh, compensation department under police and fire accident in the amount of nine thousand one hundred forty-one dollars. Parking enforcement salaries permanent in the amounts of eight thousand and four thousand dollars will be transferred to park enforcement under R and R and M vehicles. Is there? Do we take a motion? Is there a motion? Motion. Second. For on first reading. Okay. This is um this is just truing up uh, these three accounts as it's been described. Again, it's the total is twenty two two forty three. This is all funds that have already been appropriated in the FY fifteen budget. Um, we just need to move some money around. In the case of the non-contributory retirement, that's for um, actually Social Security benefits that we pay for a small universe of employees, and the estimate was a little bit off, so we need to just move some money into that. Um, same goes for the um, for the insurance account. We found that we were coming up $9,141 short, so we had a surplus in this other account, uh, the workers' comp accounts. So we want to move it into that. And then finally, the vehicles uh, are for the new electric uh, rechargeable um, parking enforcement vehicles. The, um, the bids came in a little bit higher, so we've had some vacancies in parking. We're going to transfer some of that excess money to cover that extra cost. So um, that's basically the short the quick and dirty version of what these tw this total $23,000 of re-movement uh, is. Councilor Barge? Yeah, quickly, Mayor. Do we still have, is it the same figure, three or four more retirees on that? It's, um, I think it's less than 10. It's We're down under 10 now that are still on, uh, that are still on that, that are still grandfathered under that system, so. Okay, thank yeah. you. Is there a motion to send us forward to the full council with a positive recommendation? Yeah, they're, 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 they
on the list, which is. Oh, I just missed it. I just put it away too quick. You got it? Yep. Um, upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that $15,986 be appropriated from the FY15 general fund, undesignated balance fund, free cash, to the NPS McKinney Vento Transportation Fund to provide the schools with the reimbursement from the Commonwealth, which was received by the city for the transportation of homeless students in 2014. Is there a motion? A motion. Second. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, so um, the next couple of orders uh, deal with the fact that our free cash was certified uh, recently. Um, and so we are doing some moving around of some of that, of some of those funds. This first one regarding McKinney Vento, through an oddity of the way that they reimburse us, they reimburse the school department after the close of the budget year, which means the, it has to come to the city as a revenue. So we sort of have to do this dance every year when free cash is certified. We then appropriate them this McKinney Vento money, uh, which is um, which is a transportation reimbursement. So essentially, we're just asking to uh, appropriate this fifteen thousand nine eighty six that flowed to us after the close of the fiscal year, uh, so that we can give it to the school department. So, uh, so that's essentially what's happening here. Councilor Barge. Yeah. So for an example, say that. The, um, the student who's homeless but is living with their grandparents in Chicopee would be our responsibility to make sure that he's brought to whoever. Yeah, the McKinney Vento is for homeless, uh, transporting homeless uh, students. So that's what this fund is for. And uh, and again, we want to just get the money back over to the school department. Councilor O'Donnell. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. Um, this, this, this um, the McKinney Vento transportation program, I think, was on the chopping block with the emergency cuts from the governor in the year. Was that, and, and I guess my question is, if I'm right about that, um, are we looking at a, a, a reduced amount this um, year? We were advised by uh, the governor-elect at the time, as well as the, um, the legislative leaders, to, to move ahead with these. Um, mm -hmm. They, the legis they did not believe that these were going to be cut. Um, okay. Even good. though they were proposed, uh, we were told we could move ahead with them. Great. So, Thank yeah. Are there any further questions for the mayor? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The next one is a financial order for free cash for stabilization and capital stabilization. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that $1 million be appropriated from the FY15 general fund undesignated balance free cash to the following accounts. $500,000 to the capital stabilization fund, and $500,000 to the stabilization fund. Is there a motion? A motion. Second. Mr. Mayor. So, um, so our, our free cash was just certified by the Department of Revenue, and the total uh, number in that undesignated fund balance was $3,308,364,000, uh, uh, which represents, um, uh, similarly to last year, I think we were at $3.2 million last year. That represents 3.8% of our budget. I think as I've talked to you about this over the last couple of years, the target that we tried, that the DOR recommends, is between 35 and 5%. So we're at 3.8%. So that's a good, healthy, undesignated cash balance. Uh, what we've done traditionally each year is ask you to take a certain bit of it right when it arrives and put it into our two stabilization accounts. So we're proposing again this year that we that we take a million dollars, divide it, put a 500,000 into each of our two stabilization accounts. Um, this 500,000 would raise our capital stabilization account to 2.2 million, and our general all-purpose stabilization account would be raised to 1.6 million. Uh, that would be the effect of this transfer. So uh, we'd like to do that. Um, again, part of the reason, and I think I've said this before, as we um, as we go out to bond, uh, all of our stabilization accounts will be scrutinized by the uh, bond rating agencies. And so again, we're trying to stay on this course of rebuilding our various stabilization accounts um, and free cash. Uh, um, uh, is treated differently than stabilization funds. So that's why I want to get a certain portion of this into stabilization. Are there any questions for the mayor? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Is there any new, is there any new business in finance? Motion to adjourn. Did we do E? Don't we have no, that's James coming, coming up. That's second. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Right. I'll second see? the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd second it, Councilor, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be trapped. All right. Uh, moving back. Actually, we are now back in regular session. Uh, okay. Look sharp. Moving up to midnight, here we go. We're going to go into these financial orders uh, that you just heard discuss. Financial order to surplus the parking spaces for trash receptacles is the first reading. I'll accept the motion. So Second. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. yes. Councilor Sarah. Yes. Councilor <coughs> Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Fine. <coughs> Councilor Labarge. Yes. Okay, passes in first reading. Next up is the financial orders for the budgetary transfers. This is also first reading. <coughs> I'll accept a motion. So, uh, any discussion? I Do you need a beverage? On candy? <coughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. We'll pull through this. <coughs> any discussion? No. <coughs> All those in favor, please aye. say aye. Aye. Thank you so much. I'm good now. Oh, uh, roll call. I'm sorry. Jeez. Councilor Sharon. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Lavarge. <coughs> Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Okay. Next up is financial order for free cash for the MPS <coughs> McKinney Vento Transportation. Your approval. Second. Second. Discussion. Oh. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Don. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. That passes first reading. Next up is financial order for free cash for stabilization and capital stabilization. This is first reading. I'll accept the motion. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll call. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labard. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Now we come up to the order that Sharon's been waiting for all night. Uh, this is the second reading for the, <coughs> the financial order regarding James House. I'll accept a motion. To approve. Second. second. Your Honor. Uh, so this is on second reading, correct? The second. Okay. So we've discussed again the, the, the fact that we need to be able to um, renew our leases in the building. And so uh, we, we are required to have you resurplus the building. Uh, you know, certifying that it's no longer needed for municipal purposes, and so that will allow us to renew our leases with the current tenants. I did actually, um, on second reading, because we've I found a um, uh, an omission, and I wondered if I could ask uh, that this be amended uh, in the now therefore be it resolved. Um, uh, and I'll give you the proposed amendment, and I'll explain why. Um, resolve that the James House property, what I would ask for then is to have a comma including up to 10 parking spaces in the adjacent James House parking lot comma um, is available for six years for educational and other public service uses. Uh, when we went to, um, to, to do this order to take care of the leases, we had neglected to remember that we also have designated some parking spaces in the James House lot so that the tenants have parking um, to be able to park there. Uh, and we were reminded that we needed to also resurplus those parking spaces to go with the building for the tenants. So I wanted to just sort of fold that into this order so that the two of them would be covered together so that the, the building leases wouldn't get separated from the parking spaces. Um, so the amendment I would request is that, again, after James House property, comma, including up to 10 parking spaces in the adjacent James House parking lot. Was there anyone prepared to offer that amendment? Second it. 
Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, any more information relative to the order? Not really. No, I mean, it's the same as I presented it at the last meeting. Um, we have great there. We have great tenants. Uh, uh, we'd like to keep them. Um, Literacy Project, Center for New Americans, and uh, and most recently now the, um, the Worker Center. Right. Um, and so, uh, again, we just have to, uh, yeah. Chapter 30B requires us to do this. Uh, any more questions of the mayor or any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. This is the second reading. Amended. Councilor Dwight. Amended. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. These are the other CPC uh, Community Preservation Committee recommendations for funding. This is also in second reading, and they were moved as a group. Um, this is the Bridge Street Cemetery, the HAP Project at 129 Pleasant Street, Historic North Hampton, Playground Rehabilitation for Jackson Street School, Pomeroy Terrace, Pulaski Park Design, Sawmill Hills, and Seth Thomas Clock. I'll accept a motion to move those. Move them as a group. I'll second them. Any further discussion on these items? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. We've already voted on G. Okay. Please. Next up, uh, <clears throat> this is on second reading. This is the order regarding special legislation and that. The home rule petition for liquor licenses. I'll accept the motion for another floor. Second. Councilor Adams. Mr. Mayor, I heard two arguments tonight. One was basically uh, businesses want their competition limited, and I, I don't find that very persuasive. But there was another argument about fairness, which sounded like, a, at a minimum, I'd like to hear more about. How some of the how some of the liquor license holders were saying that, um, if I understood correctly, that it only, it only take fifteen thousand dollars for their licenses to be converted, and that some are paying a hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollars for liquor licenses, and um, so could you address that? Yeah, I think I think what was being referred to is that oftentimes when a an establishment changes hands, um, the, the um, the license is monetized, I guess, as part of that transaction. Um, I, I, so, or in, there are some cases where actually literally the license is purchased. Um, so for example, there have been examples recently where an individual license was sold. Um, in fact, uh, one of the folks who spoke earlier tonight was someone who sold a license, but and they so a new business came into town. They needed a liquor license. They purchased it from an existing license holder. Now, that's not what legally happens. I mean, the, in in the eyes of the law, they go to the license commission and they file um, an application to transfer the license. And there's no six-figure charge and there's no price involved or anything like that they do have to file some basic filing fees it then has to go to the ABCC after the local license Commission approves it and they and they have to approve the transfer usually if everybody's all in good standing and and there's no issues it's a fairly seamless transfer now what happens in terms of consideration or what happens you know, privately between two individuals, that's not really, the city doesn't regulate that, the state doesn't regulate that. It's certainly not a requirement, there's certainly not a cost associated, but they have, a, one of the impacts of communities that have the quota, that are over quota, is it has given them a value. It's created a market for the licenses. So if there's an unfairness out of the city's hands and we're, we have, we can, if, if some feel that, that if, if, if business owners feel that, someone else is getting what they had to pay mm -hmm. a lot of money for for a much less amount of money it's not something we can do anything about well I mean it did happen for example with the lottery um, because the lottery license uh, was taken from a license holder um, uh, he, he had the opportunity to sell it or transfer it but he opted to not do that and it was eventually taken from him and so when you have a fresh license like that that comes back to the city when we reissue it 
uh, the only fee that was associated with it was there it was a conversion fee because it was a, a seasonal all alcohol license and we had required under a different special act that you had to pay a fee to convert it but but other than that yes that Bistro Le Gras, when they won the lottery and got that license, they didn't have to pay $150,000 for their license. So they, they got it exactly to exactly what I mean. What, what, what were these new? So the concern, the concern that they have is that if you introduce five new licenses into the license pool, that you're devaluing all of these other licenses. That's again, that's a that's a, an argument um, as a governmental body and issuing licenses that's really not um, I guess my position on this is I think the system is outdated it should end which is why I'm adopting the policy and you don't have to agree with me you get the ultimate say on it is that I'm just going to keep filing for special act licenses if people if there's a demand for licenses in the city I'm going to try to support that um, you know the, the legislature just granted Holyoke 13 licenses uh, the city of Boston, they just gave them 24 new licenses. Um, those didn't even have a business establishments associated with them. So, so, but I do understand the argument, and I understand that under the old, under the current system, which I think we should do away with, um, they are bought and sold as capital. Um, I'm not sure I agree that a bank should be lending money against a government-issued license. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not even really sure if that's what's really happening. Although they may be assessing the value of an establishment that has an all-alcohol license mm -hmm. as being more valuable than one that doesn't. Um, but I mean, I you know, I people have said if my license gets so I guess if the license gets withdrawn, is the bank going to call the note? I mean, I'm not quite sure that part of it. I don't quite understand. Um, so. But that is, those are you know those are definitely arguments, and uh, any time we add a new license, like we did with the hotel we did recently, when we did the other five all alcohol licenses, every time we've added them, this has been a concern. Questions? That's referred to this rather archaic structure that the Massachusetts has established that confers that allows us to be traded as a commodity liquor license which confers a value on it. it's essentially not regulated overseen by any of us it's a, uh, the fact that you can actually transfer your license for a cost and you can charge someone for that um, personally I think the license should revert back to the state or the community that it's just issued and then be reissued for the establishment and and that community should be allowed to determine its capacity for for liquor licenses um, unfortunately that's not the system we have, as you yeah. point out. That's if we have one that's yeah. The transfer, the capability to transfer, is what's created this, exactly. this system, because you can a, a false economy. You can do your transfer, and then you can negotiate a price to, to do the transfer on the side. The wow. city's not involved in that. Uh, Councilor Shera, did, did you say that we had issued five somewhat recently? No, we had. Um, uh, this was a long time ago. Uh, we had created some licenses for the one for the for the fairgrounds, for example. They wanted one. Um, I'm trying to remember, the country club I think needed a, a license, and there were a, there were a few others that were created. This was probably like I don't know, 2007, 2000, I mean, maybe even earlier than that. Um, and these were seasonal all alcohol licenses um, they were seasonal all alcohol licenses so they were only for again for the fairgrounds which is closed in the winter time it was a seasonal all alcohol license so we had created a, a class of those and separately we did a special act which allowed us to convert seasonal all alcohol licenses and um, and so that's sort of how this one license that had been created under that other special act um, had come to be taken away from a license holder and it had the capability to be converted um, but there's no more like that all of them that have been that are convertible have been converted um, so yeah the most recent special act all alcohol license we did was for the Fairfield Inn on Con Street that was the one we just did last year um, now whether that's viewed as competition I don't know uh, hotels may be viewed differently than a bar or restaurant um, we didn't hear any. There was no. Um, we didn't. I. I would. I didn't receive any complaints about that. Um, so. 
I wonder if you could address something else that we heard that it, it's not about it's not going to succeed in increasing the vibrancy of the city. It's not going to bring in more money. Mm -hmm. It's going to spread the same amount of money over more establishments. That was one of the things we heard from one of the commenters. Yeah, I, I don't really have um, <laughs> I, I don't really have any data around that. Um, for what's most compelling to me is that I have restaurants that have that are established that have been here um, for some time, and they've said to me that they feel like they, um, because all these other licenses have been bought up and they're sat on, in some cases, um, you know, single license holders control multiple licenses. Um, you know, four or five um, have, are now consolidated with one person. That they feel like they lose business, people who come um, and want to have mixed drink. And, and when they find out that there's no mixed drink, they, they leave and go somewhere else. And so that's the argument that I've heard from those folks. I have no data to say that, um, that there's just a, you know, a set pool of people who drink mixed drinks and that they're just going to be dispersed out, you know, to, to the, all the licenses. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but what I'm hearing is from businesses who feel like they're at a competitive disadvantage because they don't have any ability to, to, um, to obtain this license because they're all spoken for, or if they aren't spoken for, they're being spot and sold, you know, for six figures. So it, I, I understand both sides of the argument. At the end of the day, I just think the system should be done away with and that we should have a more rational, logical, local system that doesn't have this capacity to spy and sell them. But that doesn't, that's cold comfort to somebody like Jeremiah who just bought Union Station and says that part of that transaction included paying a significant premium because it came with a liquor license. So I get that. Um, and I, I'm just particularly sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, I think the frustration comes from we play by the rules as they were established, and then some other people get to skip ahead in line is the concern. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be egregiously unfair if that were actually the city's had control over that. I don't think suppressing more liquor licenses is actually going to level the playing field by any stretch of the imagination. And the fact is that, that um, somebody mentioned being competitive with the casino. Is beyond that is also the fact that retail sales are severely impacted by the presence of internet retail. And consequently, as we see spaces turn over, they're turning over into restaurants and bars and the like. They're not going back to being dry goods sales. Um, and we now, at some very recent noticeable uh, pending va vacancies of faces, the United Bank is withdrawing uh, a smaller space at an Iris Photo. We have outstanding still Spoleto. These are things, these are systems that are stuck in the center of town as vacancies and can be, perception being nine tenths of it, can, can start something worse, at least an attitude of worse. And anything that we can do to, to push and jumpstart the economy is to the good. I think the greater good is served by this. I do acknowledge and recognize that it is unfair and onerous to the current license holders, but the fact is looking at the city and the community and the downtown retail system and the downtown sales system in toto, I think it's the best way to proceed. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Um, just my own edification, when these licenses are created, are they created in perpetuity? Uh, they're cr the way we've structured it is that if, the, if a license holder were to revoke or, or you know, uh, sure. we were to pull it from them, it would, the city would retain it. We would Still retain the license yeah. and be, be able to reissue it. Some of our previous over quota licenses didn't have that provision, mm -hmm. um, and so those that those go away. If we if uh, I see. some of those over quota licenses go away, we've tried to word this so that we would still retain them. Okay. Thank um, you. And we do have. I think there's provision in the language that prevents the concern about about somebody flipping it. You know, flipping the license. Um, I think we have language in there to protect against that. Um, so it now just tripped over to midnight. Just 
for personal interest. Any further discussion on this item? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Oh, sorry. Sorry. What? Murphy? <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sarah? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Okay, this <clears throat> next up is the ordinance to correct the parking details to uh, <laughs> Chapter 312 with with a, another amendment, I'm told, but this comes with a positive recommendation from uh, ordinance and uh, this first reading. I'll accept a motion. Move Thank you. Second. Second, okay. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell, you want to? I'm gratified that it was met immediately with laughter when, when you were <laughs> uh, it is. I'm just punching. <laughs> I'll explain it very, very quickly. Uh, section one creates, uh, corrects an incorrect reference. Um, and section two in the, um, makes various changes to the limited time parking schedule. Um, first and foremost, the language that prefaces the table currently makes no sense. Uh, that language used to read, parking shall be prohibited in the following locations during the hours and for the time limit indicated. So if you applied that to the first row, you would see that parking is prohibited on Armory Street Monday through Saturday for 15 minutes, um, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The second thing this does, oh, oh, and so therefore the language is changed to parking shall be prohibited in the following locations after the expiration of the indicated time limit during the indicated hours and days. And this was vetted by the Transportation Parking Commission. Um, it also makes various corrections in terms of typos and, and street names, but. Um, most importantly, it corrects an amendment that the council put on the 15 <coughs> minutes basis from when we approved that last year. Um, the amendment was offered incorrectly, um, and so therefore the, the time limit on 15 minutes spaces was set to 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., but the correct time is 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. All those corrections are made. Um, also, a two-foot wide parking space was created in that process for very, very economical cars, um, which we have corrected those measurements uh, on West Street. Um, and I would like to just offer a friendly amendment to this, um, which is in the third row for Belmont Avenue, correct the spelling of Owaga Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> This is a major piece of uh, legislation, of course. It's, uh, lasting, it's actually lasting impact. It, it is critical, actually, to do these things right. So, um, any further discussion on this? Anyone want to contest the spelling of Awaga? <laughs> I challenge anyone to spell Awaga right now. A H. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no further discussion. Roll call, please. <laughs> Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sherra? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Next up, and I think Councilor Adams wants to speak to this, but ordinances pertaining to solid waste reduction. Um, I'll accept the motion and put that on the floor. This, isn't this to refer? That's a refer. Uh, I'm sorry for referral. Move to uh, refer to refer the new Public Works. Uh, committee, um, Public Works Commission and the Public Works Committee. Actually, second. I'm confused as to why it's back if it still has to be referred to those committees. But, uh, it was yeah. never referred to those committees because they weren't established well, yet. Well, the, oh, is that, oh. Mm. One of them uh, is the new committee. Yeah. The new so Public Works Committee of the City Council. When we first referred this out in like September, it didn't just go to the DPW at that point? I mean the BPW, which was the BPW at that point. Oh, right, they never took it up, so no, there is no. They're reorganized as a different body, so. And, and but, but the other thing is, is that um, asked this question of the city solicitor, who said it needed to go back on the agenda to be referred to these new committees. So. Um, and that's for both of these, right? Just the the ordinance and the enforcing ordinance. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing different. It's just new committees. New committee, refer new committee, same referral, if you will. Same great taste. <coughs> and we have three referrals. I don't know if you want to take them as a group, but the oh, yes, yeah, please. Uh, for, the, the, for the same reasons, okay? Yeah, the yeah, other yeah, one is an ordinance regarding bicycles and pedestrian facilities. 
and ordinances pertaining to snow and ice yeah, on I sidewalks. Refer, move them all as a group. Second. For reference. Second. For Second. referral to? To the uh, re recommended committees. Yeah. To the recommended Second. committees. OK. All right. Any discussion on those referrals? Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. any opposed? Any abstentions? Isn't there another one? Just stick to the I read. Right? Yes. Chain well, no, no, you know what? I'm sorry. I missed. Uh, no, 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 I got bicycles. I did that. Yes. Uh, pertaining to solid waste, ordinance regarding bicycles and pedestrian facilities. Oh, 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 oh